What's the worst thing about the current state of bodybuilding? Well, I don't know. There's just so much to pick to choose from. It's hard to know what the worst is. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a uh, pleasure to introduce to you Stan Efferding, the white rhino, founder of The Vertical Diet, and the world's strongest pro bodybuilder with a row total of 2,226 pounds in the 275 pound class and coach of many other inspiring figures and athletes such as Brian Shaw, Hathar Bjornsson, John Jones, right? But Stan, I just wanted to say I'm a, I'm a big fan, like a huge fan of everything you do from training and bodybuilding to uh, the right diet to fight chronic disease. And I just wanted to say thank you for coming on this podcast and doing everything you do man thanks for having me brother i always worry i'm, I'm a dinosaur now you know i'm 55 but i, uh, <laughs> I started competing in 1988 and so uh I've, I've learned a lot of lessons along the way and i'm always uh, uh humbled and appreciative that young cats uh would listen to a guy like me uh, hopefully understanding that i've i've been through it man every step of the way from a 140 pound freshman in college they couldn't even bench 135, you know, to have competed in some of the most uh, incredible organizations in the world in bodybuilding and powerlifting for damn near 30 years. So thanks for having me on. I think you might have a, uh, a youthful audience that hopefully I can pass along some wisdom to. I hope so. I hope so, too. Um, but I think uh, no matter what field you're in, we, we need mentors to really guide us. So honestly, just listening to your information, your podcasts, your book, everything that you've done has been helping me immensely in my own journey. Not to mention that I was also 145 pounds when I went into college freshman year too. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to follow that journey of like gaining mass, but in the proper way. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. I, I always say, I wish I knew then what I know now. It's been a, a heck of a journey and I made a lot of mistakes along the way. So your audience might, might understand. I, Probably conservatively gained and lost bulking up to become a 300 pound power lifter and dieting down to compete in single digit body fat year after year after year after year. And obviously that was a progression. I would compete in powerlifting. I would diet down, compete in bodybuilding. I'd bulk up and compete in powerlifting. And I did that year after year after year. In over a 25 year career, I gained and lost well over a thousand pounds. And I learned a lot of lessons along the way as to Jesus things I did Christ. very, very wrong and, uh, and ways to do it right. And so, uh, anybody who's trying to either gain or lose weight, I think I've got some good insight. Wait, so how did the Rhino nickname come along? Uh, that was Flex Wheeler, 2009. When I went and trained with him in San Jose. Uh, I was obviously a, uh, a power lifter at the time. I had been bodybuilding, competing for over 20 years, but, uh, I had kind of made a name for myself in powerlifting, and then Flex Wheeler helped me get my IFBB Pro card. And so he nicknamed me the Rhino just because I, I like to lift heavy weights a lot. Although he managed to rein me in, just uh, uh, just purely, I guess, out of out of trust of what Flex uh, you know wanted me to do. I just I followed everything he said to a T, and it worked right. out great. And I I just found out that powerlifting did not improve my bodybuilding and he uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, probably probably the big test of that so he, he wouldn't let me bench squat or deadlift for over six months from the time that we not worked even, together not uh, even not even squat no no and you have wow. to understand that's mainly because i had you know power lifting the intent is to recruit multiple muscle groups and to utilize leverage and generally a relatively shorter range of motion uh, Flex saw that I was uh, very strong in the glutes, in the hips, in the spinal erectors, none of which are great bodybuilding body parts, to be honest. Yeah, and so he, uh, he wanted me to isolate the quads, uh, work more on the hamstrings. And mm. uh, uh, so we moved away from the squat, which a lot of you know great bodybuilders have done. You've heard Doreen Yates talk about how he went away from the squat early in his career, as did Jay Cutler, they would use it maybe as a finishing movement with an angle plate, with a high bar. Uh, but as for the foundation of their quad development, they moved away from it very quickly, partly because it's hard to isolate the quads. You incorporate a lot of back and glutes and hips, uh -huh. but also partly because the loads required uh, put you at greater injury to risk. And so you really want yep. to utilize a machine that, um, you know, a hack squat or a, a leg press in particular that you can isolate the quads better, get a, a better range of motion and just mm -hmm. to kind of have less uh, 
And you could get closer to failure with uh, uh, less potential injury risk on, on a machine. That's facts. Um, I myself, I'm just too... Like my ego just gets the better of me, so I just can't like let go of squatting. So I just added the squat shoes for the little heel elevation and the knee sleeve, so that way I can focus more on my quads. But uh, that's uh, honestly, you know, yeah. I was gonna say it has a lot to do with an individual's what we call anthro anthropometry, right? Their limb mm -hmm. lengths, and you some people with uh, a shorter femur may be able to squat with a relatively vertical torso. Mm. and get a lot of uh, uh, knee angle, a good uh, knee over toe, uh, and not load the glutes and hips and may get you know, a lot of benefit from squatting for quads. Uh, other people like myself with a long femur end up loading the butt. Uh, the torso becomes more and more horizontal, uh, and that, uh, that can kind of compromise the stress being focused on the quad and throws more of it onto the glute. Right, 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 right. But honestly, I'm I'm pretty obsessed with your story with uh your your little training art with Flex Wheeler. I think it's so epic, because and it's like exactly the story that I relate to. Being someone who's uh, just as when you first started training, I I tried to max out like every single week when I was like first starting lifting. Like I just had this. I don't know. I, I knew that that wasn't co totally correct in programming, but like my mindset was very like old school bodybuilding, like go hard or go home. Like that's how you make your gains. So like every week I just try to be PRing on um, my PR was like 405 for eight reps. But I, every time I did legs, I would start with that exercise and try to get more than eight reps or try to go a little heavier than four or five. And that was literally every single leg day at max exertion. And here I was like wondering why I was going the, re the next couple of days with brain fog and my legs weren't growing in size, <laughs> which is super frustrating. Yeah, that's, that's very common. That, that definitely happens maxing out every single week. And what, again, what you find is, is that the range of motion, particularly the knee angle, Mm -hmm. so that your quad is in a stretched position, gets compromised uh, for the load. That becomes kind of the primary driver or, or what you said your ego uh, gets you focused on. And it just uh, it doesn't generally result in, in very much quad growth. Uh, you get strong, but strength is uh, a lot of a nervous system adaptation. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily, I mean, obviously you're going to get somewhat bigger, but not bodybuilding big uh, from powerlifting. Powerlifters are rarely as big as bodybuilders in terms of just the sheer volume of the muscles. Right. Right. Which is frustrating to me, man, because everybody wants to be jacked and everybody wants to be big, but not everybody can be jacked and big unless your name is uh, Stan Efferding or Ronnie Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always said that, uh, you know, and, and Ronnie, I never really power build it. I, people always said, how do you bodybuild and powerlift at the same time? When I got good, uh, I was doing one or the other. I wasn't mm. doing both simultaneously. I wasn't power building necessarily. I would spend, uh, well, like you said, you'd get an extraordinary amount of fatigue, systemic fatigue from powerlifting. And that can impair your ability to increase frequency and volume for bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And that was just yep. because the loads were so heavy that you would, uh, we call it central nervous system fatigue, but uh, you know, just generally speaking, it's fatigue and it, it's gross load that, kind of dictates how much uh, total work you can do, how much volume, uh, and how quickly you recover. And so if you isolate a muscle group, you can get incredibly sore but not have the same system fatigue. So you can go the next day and do chest, and you can go the next day and do back. And then, you you know, three days later, you do legs again. And the muscles are sore, but the, the general systemic fatigue is minimized. Wait, so... Can you explain the difference between CNS fatigue and just fatigue? Well, as Pat Davidson, PhD exercise phys, explained it to me, he goes, that it really isn't. We're kind of being too specific when we talk about CNS fatigue, central nervous system fatigue. It was a bit of a buzzword for a while there. It's just fatigue. It's all fatigue. It's just how tired are you? And that's dictated by, uh, mm -hmm. with respect to powerlifting, just the total gross load. So, for instance, you could do a low bar back squat with, say, you know, 500 pounds, and you'd accumulate a lot more fatigue than if you did a high bar angle plate, you know, much deeper front squat or, you know, high bar squat with half the load. But as long as you got to within a rep or two of failure, you, could, you would still stimulate the same hypertrophy response for the quad mm. muscles. But you would have accumulated significantly less overall fatigue, meaning 
you could recover faster from that workout. You could train a different body part the next day and you just wouldn't be generally fatigued. You mentioned having brain fog for 24 to 48 hours or 72. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you put massive loads on your body. And so I, I, I simplify it. I don't talk about central nervous system fatigue anymore. I just talk generally about fatigue and the way to, to lower fatigue is just to have less total gross load. It's the body doesn't know weight. You, you, you're well aware and your audience is probably aware now from, from all of Brad Schoenfeld's research and the like that you can build the same amount of muscle tissue lifting a heavy load, say 85% of your one rep max for a set of five, as you can build, uh, lifting a medium load, 70% of your one rep max for say eight to 12, as you can a lighter load, 50% of your one rep max for 20 to 25 reps. Mm -hmm. So long as each set is taken to within a rep or two of failure, you get equivalent hypertrophy outcomes from those three different loads, but you get significantly more fatigue from the, heavy from the heaviest load. Wow. Yeah. And that's why we kind of, you know, the, these research scientists will often say, hey, the bros were right. That kind of eight to 12, you know, 10 to 15 rep range. It seems like you can do the most volume there with the most frequency and not overtrain. Rather than going in and lifting super, super heavy every single time, you just find that you, you're, uh, you're much more tired faster and you may end up overreaching or overtraining. Mm -hmm. What about these like 15 And that's not to say, you know, because you have different muscle fibers, slow twitch and too, too fast twitch, uh, uh, you, then you want to train each of them. Then that's not to say that maybe once a week, say you're training chest twice a week. One of those workouts, you might work up to a top set of five and then do your, you know, do your down sets or pick a second exercise to finish, you know, the rest of your workout in the eight to 12 range and finish with one AMRAP, right? As many reps as possible, a set of 20. So that to me would be a really productive workout because you're getting a, a heavy set of five, you're getting, you know, maybe four or five sets of eight to 12, and you're getting, you know, one or two finishers of 20 reps. That's a nice, uh, uh, workout that covers all of the muscle groups. Mm -hmm. And then the second chest workout of the week, you might not need to do the top five, top set of five. You might just do all of your hypertrophy range. Uh, but generally speaking, you should still progress the same exercises over time. Whether you add a rep or five pounds week after week, your body, if, if it's not forced to do something, it, uh, to, to do something it hasn't done before, uh, it'll stop adapting. So you do still need to uh, push either a little bit of weight or an extra repetition uh, with the same exercise uh, week after week over time. Gotcha. So what about that 15 to 20 rep range? I mean, uh, considering that we know that that's kind of common, especially if you're doing something like leg days or like leg extensions in the bodybuilding community with slow eccentrics and stuff. Uh, what is your perception on that with overall volume and fatigue? Well, obviously the loads are lighter. And so you're not going to have the same impact as, say, a heavy five. But it could be a little tiring for – here's my concern when we start getting into higher reps. We'll cover two or three things here. We'll cover the higher reps. My concern is that the, the limiting factor becomes your cardiovascular fitness or your ability to clear lactate from mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. Those are things that you can get better at over time with practice. Uh, but it might not necessarily be that you're failing due to mechanical tension, you know, uh, uh, maximum muscle fiber recruitment, and then eventually uh, starting to fail on that. Uh, so I, I think they're valuable. I don't know if I would do every set there. And, and you know, just like doing too much, I guess it would depend on, on how, how high your heart rate went for how long a period of time. It's like you only want to do HIIT training maybe twice a week. It can be pretty fatiguing as well on your cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be able to recover from from that kind of volume. I would also caution that you need sufficient rest between sets, irrespective of the rep range, because you want each subsequent set. So you're doing three sets. You'd like the third set with the same weight to be, you'd like to be able to do just as many repetitions or pretty close to it. If you go in and do some incline dumbbell press with the 100-pound dumbbells, in the first set you can get 10, in the second set 8, and the third set 6, I'd, I'd suggest you didn't rest long enough between those sets and 
the, the muscles haven't had a chance to fully recover. In particular, the creatine phosphate system hasn't completely restored. And then you're losing out on valuable repetitions that are the result of, of, like I mentioned earlier, kind of a deficiency in creatine phosphate or maybe your own lactate clearance capability or even oxygen debt. And so I always suggest to get at least two, maybe on leg day, three, four minutes between sets. And it's hard for Mm. young people in particular not to conflate their weight training workout with conditioning. Sometimes they think working harder is breathing heavier and sweating more. Mm -hmm. And that's not a a good proxy for hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. It's a very different stimulus. I call it battle ropes and burpees. It's like CrossFit. You know, you get, you get good at a lot of things, but you don't get great at anything. If you want to be great at hypertrophy, if you want your muscles to maximally grow, then you want to apply the evidence-based guidelines for hypertrophy. And that suggests that you want to be just as strong set after set after set uh, until such time that your substrates are depleted to the point where you've kind of not going to get any more return on your investment for additional sets. You know, that, that's somewhere around, you know, some people suggest after six sets of the same body part, you're going to get significantly diminished returns. Some people might be able to do eight or 10 total sets, but you get north of that. And I'm either concerned, A, that uh, you're saving yourself, that a lot of the sets are junk volume, right? or B, that you're just digging a deeper hole. You know, there's going to be obviously some, when you're training, you're going to break down muscle tissue. And then when you recover, you're going to build that back up and hopefully super compensate so that you're adding more muscle tissue than you had before. Uh, And some people, they get into this never ending cycle of just breaking it down and rebuilding without super compensating before they go in and break it down again. And the super compensation is the adaptation portion where your muscles should get get larger and and stronger, uh, which is why a good measurement of that is the progression over time. Did you, can you lift one more rep or can you lift five more pounds with that same exercise week over week over week? And it's not linear, but it should progress. And if you can't, then you're kind of spinning your wheels. You're possibly not getting the, the result. So there's a lot to consider. And you mentioned eccentric, the, uh, what we refer to as time under tension or kind of the pace at which you do a rep. It seems that anywhere between two and five second eccentrics get equivalent results. And uh, more than that is unnecessary and probably adversely uh, can adversely impact your recovery because eccentrics do have, uh, do accumulate more fatigue, more muscle tissue breakdown. And that's not necessarily a driver of hypertrophy. We used to think that, that soreness was a pretty good indicator of, of good workout for hypertrophy. And in fact, it's not a good workout. I could have you go out and run a 10K, you'd be sore the next day, but you're not building any muscle. So a lot of eccentric loading doesn't necessarily translate to growth. Much of the time, it's a novel stimulus, meaning you, you put in a new exercise you hadn't done in a while. And then you, you are really sore the next day and you think, oh man, that, that's a, I'm going to keep doing that one. That one's great. That's, mm-hmm. you know, I got sore. <laughs> But that's not a good proxy for, for results for hypertrophy. It's way down on the list, and it might just be a passenger. It might not have any bearing. It might just be a good indicator that you train hard, but it could be attributable to either overtraining or a novel stimulus, in which case uh, it's a very little benefit at all. And you'll notice that when you continue to do that same exercise week over week over week, you get less and less sore. Uh, because it, it, your body has adapted to the novel stimulus, and, and mm-hmm. uh, that doesn't mean it's less effective. The effectiveness of it will is is based on your ability to progress it over time, not right. how sore it makes you. Right. Yeah. This is where I see a lot of value with deload weeks, at least in my own experience. Uh, before I was doing proper programming, I just go week of, week after week after week, tearing down the muscles and then only repairing them to basically the same state, not getting any stronger, and then. The moment I decided to like really calculate what I was doing, take a deload week off and everything, I'd always find that I somehow came even stronger the next week or the next few weeks. Yeah. And experienced lifters should auto-regulate that. They should always pay attention. And like you said, if you overreached a little uh, and you come in and you're just tired and you can't uh, meet or beat your previous performance, um, then it, it could be time that either to take a good assessment on what's going on outside the gym, sleep calories, hydration, stress. And if all of those things are in order and you're carefully monitoring those, then it could be time to, to take a, a week where you just do half the weight for half the reps with half the sets or just take the whole week off if you choose to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, or just one workout off that week for each body part. So train it once instead of twice. But uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so there's nothing wrong with, with um, you know, every 
five or six weeks or so. And I hate to put a time on it because if you're continually progressing, if you're getting stronger uh, and outperforming your last workout, there's no reason to, to force yourself to take a break until such time that, uh, again, auto-regulation, that you feel some degree of fatigue. One way you can measure that, uh, which is actually a lagging indicator, is just testing your resting heart rate every morning. We used to do this with the wrestlers uh, way back in, in the 90s when I was working with the University of Oregon. Uh, they, uh, the wrestlers would test the resting heart rate in the morning. And if it was about 10 beats elevated above normal, it, then they should take a day off. And they're probably a day late in doing so. That's what we call a lagging indicator. The leading indicators now, when you get good powerlifting coaches like Mike Tashir, uh, they'll test the velocity of the bar. And they'll still uh, put a, a meter on the bar and they'll see how fast you move a particular weight. Because if you lift a heavier weight slower, you didn't necessarily, you weren't necessarily stronger. And so they'll measure their speed and that'll kind of determine whether or not they're going to go. Uh, this is kind of now migrated over into a powerlifting conversation, but uh, that'll determine whether or not they're going to try and hit a top, you know, a, a 85 plus percent single that day right. is if the 70% load is moving slow, then they, they're, that's a pretty good indicator that, that, uh, that you don't have it in you and you might want to wait till the next workout. Mm, gotcha. So what, can you explain like this meter that they put on the bar? Yeah, it'll measure how quickly the velocity of the bar, how quickly the bar moves. And if you move a bar, uh, very fast or, Really, it's relative to how quickly you moved it previously. When you start getting up to, say, a 70% of your one rep max and you, you do a lift, if it moves very fast, then you're clearly very powerful, uh, strength divided by time. And you, you might use that as a measurement to uh, determine how you're going to progress. How much weight am I going to add? Uh, damn, bar's moving really fast today. I'm pretty strong today. Uh, and so you, you know, rather than before... Uh, if you just used weight as the indicator and didn't pay attention to how fast you moved the weight, then you wouldn't have a good measurement of, uh, uh, of how strong you were necessarily. You just worked harder uh, or strained more uh, to, to move the same weight you might have moved last week. Uh, if you're continually moving it slower, you're not necessarily getting it stronger. An interesting quote from the guys at Barbell Medicine. See if I can remember it. They said, you don't add weight to get stronger. You get stronger so you can add weight. Really interesting perspective rather than just continuing to force yourself to grind and grind and grind because linear progressions, adding weight every single week, that works for a while, but it doesn't work forever. And at some point, you're just going to start accumulating more and more fatigue as we discussed you know, initially. Uh, and you'll just find that you'll, uh, you may overreach and end up getting, all of a sudden getting weaker. Uh, many of us who have been lifting for a long time know what that feels like. You, you hit a PR and the next thing you know, you're, you know, 30, 50 pounds below that a week or two later, and you can't figure out why everything got so heavy all of a sudden. And it's just, you just overreached, you know, and hopefully didn't overtrain, which might take oftentimes weeks or a few months to recover from. And so it's a kind of a constant, uh, testing. This is what the folks at, Bar or at uh, Westside Barbell did so well under Louis Simmons is, he wouldn't necessarily use the uh, maximum loads on the competition lifts very frequently. Uh, when I'm trying to improve my deadlift, I don't want to deadlift heavy every single week. I want to use some sort of accessory exercise that's transferable, that doesn't, that I don't incur as much fatigue. Louis liked a lot of box squatting. Uh, you didn't accumulate as much fatigue. And then you would use the, the competition lift as a test. So I would deadlift, say, once a month heavy. And the other four weeks in between that time, I would find an alternate exercise like a box squat or a front squat uh, and a good morning. And I would build those up because I couldn't do – if I can deadlift 700 pounds, I'm not doing a 700-pound front squat. And I'm not doing a 700-pound good morning. But I might be able to do 405 on front squats for sets of five. And I might be able to do 405 on good mornings for sets of five. And I can try and build that over time to where I'm, I'm, maybe I'm doing a 420 or a 430 or I'm doing a set of six. And then by the time I come around to test my deadlift at the end of the four weeks, if I've grown my front squat and I've grown my good morning, my deadlift should go up. 
If it doesn't, I need to pick a different exercise to progress that's transferable. And that way you can accumulate a lot less fatigue. You don't have to pull as heavy as often, wow. uh, which uh, kind of puts, puts you in a position to where you're not you know, potentially going to overreach or overtrain and maybe even get injured. That's so crazy that it's total load. It's total load. So for someone who, because, uh, you know, if there's anything that I've ever wanted, you know, it's to be Mr. Mr. Olympia and a powerlifting record holder at the same time. And <laughs> so, uh, so difficult. But if there's anyone who wants to focus, like say that um, Joe Schmo has a bodybuilding competition coming up, but he also has a, he's also, you know, um, scheduled himself for a powerlifting meet, say like several weeks afterwards. Uh, how would you recommend that he, I say partitions, say that he has powerlifting days and like bodybuilding days, and I'm sure his bodybuilding focus days are more often in this program. How would you partition that? Like, how would you schedule those days? I like what I just described. Strength is specific, meaning that you're going to have to, to lift heavy loads in order to get stronger. It's a, it has a significant uh, amount to do with nervous system adaptations. So I would probably stay in the five rep range for building muscle and utilize, uh, as mentioned, say a front squat, I'd get more quad, but I could use less total load and then test my lifts. I'd only lift heavy uh, about every four weeks. I might test a squat um, <clears throat> or test a deadlift. Uh, I would alternate. I would do, say, a heavy squat. Uh, and then two weeks later, a heavy deadlift and two weeks later, a heavy squat. But in between those times, I was building my capacity or, or uh, growing, building my strength, my transferable strength on movements that were less fatiguing. Mm. Front squat, good morning. Uh, and those, you know, front squat's going to build through, through a significant range of motion is going to build great uh, quad mass. And uh, a good morning, if uh, um, appropriately uh, performed is going to get you good stretch and good hamstring, uh, results. So I would, uh, I would definitely recommend those. You could certainly hack squat. Um, but my guess is you could, you could, uh, lift more load in hack squat than you could in front squat and, uh, and therefore maybe accumulate more fatigue. Hmm. But th that's what I would do. I would build muscle in mostly the five rep range, or at least touch more of those than I would, uh, if I wasn't power lifting, uh, because they are specific. And I would utilize those accessory movements that transfer and only pull heavy on a deadlift, say once a month or once every five weeks, just to test whether or not the training that I'm doing is transferable to my strength. So if you're doing the, say that heavy lift, what would be the rep range you said around five or less than five? Right around five. I think that would be a, a good one. And then uh, you can, once a month you would test, you would pull a deadlift and do your single. And even then the single should be, I wouldn't exceed 90%. Mikhail Kokleev, a famous uh, strongman, power lifter, uh, Olympic lifter for the Russians, um, he would only deadlift over 90% twice a year and only max out twice a year. Wow. Uh, the two 90 percenters were to qualify for Worlds and the national championships, uh, and the two max efforts were at Worlds in the national championship. So four times a year, he was pulling over 90% of his one rep max. Whoa. Other than that, he was doing sets of fives, and uh, he would, uh, on the fifth rep, he would do a very slow eccentric. He might do some cluster sets where he would do, say, 85% of a one rep max. He would do a single, rest 30 seconds or a minute, do another single, and you accumulate repetitions that way. But resting uh, about a minute in between each set, called referred to as a cluster set, and that is a little less fatiguing, uh, but allows you to accumulate repetitions, which is just practice, Man. really. Um, which is a lot of people don't get very much practice if they're only pulling once a month, uh, and so you you may want to do more repetitions with a lighter weight uh, more often. Uh, although, as mentioned. Strength is specific unless you're practicing in pretty close to the range that you're going to be lifting. Uh, it's got, not going to be very transferable. There was a time in which uh, so, there were a lot of bodybuilders that were trying to lift 70% loads, mostly not bodybuilders, power lifters. We're trying to lift 70% loads, and then go to a meet and attempt a max. And we were seeing injuries as a result. It's just not specific enough. It's not close enough. 
uh, the central nervous system doesn't uh, have doesn't have a sufficient stimulus and doesn't adapt for those heavy loads. Uh, we were seeing injuries. We were seeing people get folded under heavy weights and, and tear quads. So that can be dangerous. You uh, gradually work your way up and uh, uh, you know specifically train for those heavy loads, but not with the amount of not not so not as frequently as uh, as people think they need to once a month playing. So you said seventy percent was where they wasn't seeing. Yeah, there was a time there at which powerlifters were attempting to do uh, only seventy percent training. They go to a meet and try a hundred percent load, and they were getting injured. What percentage? It's not heavy enough. So not specific enough for like the uh, the five rep range, and then that guy who did a slow eccentric on his last rep. Around what percentage of your one rep max? Uh, it's probably a five rep is probably an eighty five percent. Okay, okay, eighty five like that, or the whole one rep and then take a rest and then one rep, take a rest. Yeah, the cluster sets. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. Okay. Cool. Taking notes. Uh, so as for the bodybuilding portion of the program, so that they wanted to do bodybuilding at the same time as powerlifting and everything. Um, cause I know they'd be trying to focus on getting a lot more volume throughout the rest of their program on those days. I'm assuming you would just suggest, uh, like your normal higher rep ranges, uh, one to two reps from failure. Is there anything else you would suggest regarding the bodybuilding program? Let me back up real quickly and say that my suggestion would be to program over a longer period of time. I mentioned Mikhail Kokleyev. Uh, uh, his coach, Boris Shako, programmed for uh, Olympic athletes for many years, quite a famous uh, uh, coach. They write long-term plans. They have five-year plans. It's not about, I'm going to do a bodybuilding show and two weeks later do a powerlifting meeting. Uh, they don't look at things in terms of three or four months. They look at things in terms of years. And so the big picture, I would, I would suggest that you schedule uh, your bodybuilding and powerlifting meets at least three months apart. Eddie Cohn did this throughout his career, the greatest powerlifter of all time, 130, 40, 50 world records. Eddie Cohn did this throughout his career. He would compete twice a year in powerlifting. And in between those powerlifting meets, he would do a hypertrophy phase, a bodybuilding style phase, where he didn't uh, lift anywhere near the same loads that he would lift when he was prepping for powerlifting. Now, he didn't actually compete in bodybuilding, but he was bodybuilding. And he built a very thickly muscled physique, started competing at 165 and ended up at 242 over the course of his career. And that was just because he built a massive amount of muscle. And he did it with traditional bodybuilding exercises. Leg presses, bent rows, behind the neck shoulder presses, those kinds of things. Uh, he would do those in, quote unquote, the off season uh, from powerlifting. Uh, and he used that kind of training just to build more muscle mass. A bigger muscle can become a stronger muscle. Um, another thing is, is that you're doing a variety of movements from so many different angles that you shore up any potential weaknesses uh, that you might uh, acquire from just powerlifting because people kind of, they close in around those three movements and they, uh, they might find that, that they make themselves more susceptible to injury. Uh, so a lot more hamstring, a lot more posterior chain work, uh, through a greater range of motion. So now back to bodybuilding, um, we said that I'd like to get you to train, you know, most of your sets in the 10 to 12 rep range, but then there's other, those other things, train everything twice a week, uh, do 10 to 20 sets per body part per week. Um, uh, range of motion is of significant importance, getting to within a rep or two of failure, uh, sufficient rest time between sets uh, is vital. Um, we talked about the, uh, uh, two to five second eccentric, just basically lowering the weight under control. Um, all of those things contribute to, uh, optimizing hypertrophy, obviously maintaining a, a slight calorie surplus. If your uh, body composition affords you that, uh, sufficient protein, lots of sleep, uh, you know, cause you don't grow in the gym. All you do is break down muscle tissue. So, you know, I'm, I'm heavy on what goes on outside the gym. That's what I track. When my clients send me information. I'm, I'm less interested in what they lifted. I, I might look at their, their primary exercise and see if they're progressing it over time, but I'm much less interested in that than I am. And how many hours of sleep did you get? How many calories did you get? How much protein did you get? Those kinds of things, uh, uh, you know, and then what your scale weight looks like, because I don't want you obviously being in a deficit and losing weight over time. It's really hard to build muscle in a deficit. Um, and then some stress management, hydration uh, becomes really important. 
And then those each workout is, uh, you know, you're just, you're able to outperform the previous workout because you've done all the things outside the gym that carry over that bout, that one hour bout is pretty critical. You know, we spend all this time sleeping, eating, hydration, stress management, all that kind of stuff, preparing for that one hour bout of training. And that one hour bout of training will determine uh, whether or not you're going to progress. Was it sufficient enough uh, to stimulate some sort of response that you're uh, pursuing, whether it's hypertrophy or strength? I think, uh, uh, I forget who said, was it Greg Duchette said, uh, just train harder than last time. There's a lot to be said about that. If you uh, if you haven't if you aren't taking your body someplace it hasn't been before, it's not going to adapt. You can't just keep doing what you've always done and expect it to keep growing or getting stronger. You have to consistently, constantly test it over time and take it to a new level. I do feel I do feel though that uh, I personally think that that statement is better adjusted to also train smarter than last time. Since yeah, <laughs> especially from my experience. Yeah, the caveat to that is is that. A hundred percent. The caveat to that is, is that, that uh, uh, you know, injuries are going to set you back. Mm-hmm. And I've always said that, that eventually you're going to have to rest, you know, or, or you're going to have to program your training such that you sufficiently recover. I should say, it's not like you just overtrain, 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 rest, recover, and then go overtrain, overtrain, overtrain. The, the progression is important. You don't go zero to a hundred, you go zero to one, one to two, two to three. It's a gradual process and everybody's at different stages. Uh, so if you aren't responsibly managing your progression, then you can put yourself into a compromised position. And I've said that uh, eventually you're going to deload uh, or you're going to take a break, uh, either because you got injured or you got sick uh, eventually uh, because the iron always wins. And so you, you have to be very, uh, uh, I think, careful about uh, auto regulation, listening to your body. Uh, and making sure that you're ready for that next workout. If you got to take a day off, take a day off. Uh, and it might just be one. It might be three days. You know, mm-hmm. it's going to depend. Uh, and a lot of that c- could be things are out of are, aren't in order outside the gym. And once all of the everything's back in order, get back in there, crush it. And it's uh, it's it has to be something that's that's definitely progressed over time. You just how many guys have you seen over the years? You and I both, and, and everyone in the audience that. Uh, you know, you see them for two years at the gym training relatively consistently, but they haven't changed. Mm. It's all too common, you know, and that's fine if that's your goal is just to, to stay fit. Uh, but if your goal is to, uh, to progress, whether it's strength or size, then it has to be a very deliberate investment uh, and it's multifactorial and you have to continue to take your body somewhere it hasn't been before. Mm-hmm. And that puts you at risk of injury. Show me somebody who's never been injured. I'll show you somebody who's never won anything. All the great names. Uh, Lane Norton. <laughs> How many times has Lane Norton hurt his back? You know? How many times has even Mike Tashir, one of the smartest powerlifting coaches in the world, has hurt himself uh, repeatedly? Uh, the guys at Barbell Medicine, MDs, uh, mm-hmm. fantastic lifters, had multiple injuries over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, and they themselves overtrained, overreached. Uh, lost strength, had to come back, uh, and that's a that's a vicious cycle. Um, but that's you know that's kind of the tightrope that you walk over time when you keep pushing yourself further and further uh, in order for you know to hopefully progress without uh, either getting injured or overreaching. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a bit of a dam. I do think that's the biggest struggle um, when it comes to like really managing and I guess detecting your fatigue. What would you suggest? I feel like it really just comes down to trial and error and then seeing how your body responds. A hundred percent. Yeah. And and there are, again, there are some things you could do. You can measure your bar speed. You can test your uh, resting heart rate the the day after uh, a training and see if it's, if it's staying elevated. There are some things that you can, that you can measure, but generally speaking, listen to your body. If you go into the gym and everything feels heavy that day, you know, whether that's, just because you're overtrained or because, uh, you know, didn't sleep enough, eat enough or uh, hydrate well enough, then, you know, you're going to have to uh, fix those problems. One of the things I liked, always liked about powerlifting and bodybuilding is that it's immediate feedback. You go to the gym and if you have a poor performance, generally speaking, something you did in the last 72 hours can be identified that would have made that performance uh, decline. And that would you know, maybe you overtrained your, maybe you trained too hard or did too much volume and 
and didn't responsibly manage your, your progress on your previous leg day three days ago. That could be a very good reason why you're having a poor leg day today because a, a buddy came into town and you guys went head to head and you did 40% more volume and weight than you normally do. And, you know, you, you guys am wrapped a, a damn near a five rep max. And, you know, I've done that. We've all done that. You know, there's a, a camera crew is in and we're shooting some Instagram content and <laughs> next thing you know, an extra, extra plate goes on the bar, you know, some knee sleeves get put on and, uh, you know, that, that's the way it, it happens, and, you know, but it's always immediate feedback. You can always, uh, you know, generally look back to the last three days and, and figure out what the problem was, fix it and be able to outperform, you know, in the next workout. It brings me to something that I was actually thinking of, uh, cause you mentioned about the quad position earlier. And I remember hearing you say this in another podcast and I found this really fascinating. You said the length in quad position can actually give you more hypertrophy in the end ranges down here as opposed to uh, the partial range of motion might give you more hypertrophy in the center part of the muscle. I was wondering if you might be able to expound on that. Yeah. Now let's be clear to say that your tendon muscle insertions are genetic. Some people, their muscle will uh, connect to their tendon closer to the knee. Let's say if we're talking about the quadricep, uh, in which case you'll have more mass around your knee because there's just more muscle tissue there. We see that in biceps. Some people have a long bicep that kind of looks like it ties right into the, uh, the crease of the elbow there. And other people have a, you know, that might be the bicep might tie into the tendon three inches above the crease of the elbow. That's genetic. You can't change that because you can't build muscle out of tendon. Having said that, where that muscle ties in, what we would call the end range, when you train in a lengthened position, you'll see more muscle growth, more hypertrophy in those end ranges, as opposed to if you trained partial range of motion. Let's give an example. If you're on a leg extension and you only go down to where you're uh, at 90 degrees, right? Between your uh, uh, upper leg and your lower leg, you go down at 90 degrees, right? And then you do your leg extensions. That would, you know, obviously you can, you can grow from that. But now if you go down to where your calf is almost touching your hamstring and that uh, uh, your heel is up close to your butt, this is assuming your leg extension machine accommodates that range of motion. Some machines don't. The stack bottoms out before you can get a really significant range of motion, like 120 degrees at the knee. Uh, this is why we like angle plates sometimes because uh, ankle mobility, uh, angle plates under your, your heels whenever you're squatting because ankle mobility can limit or calf tightness can limit the amount of, uh, that your knee can travel over your toe, which will limit the amount of stretch your quadricep can experience. And so if we use an angle plate, now you can get your knees way out over your toes. You get a, a massive stretch in the quads. You can get 120 degrees of knee angle, uh, meaning your calf is your hamstring sitting on your calf. Uh, some great videos. If you watch Mike Israetel's stuff, um, of, uh, him and his guys doing full range of motion, you'll see that they sit right on their calves and that's to get maximum, uh, quadricep lengthening and in the lengthened position, uh, as extreme as you can, uh, you know, with, a, without injury as you can manage over time. And this is something that you have to progress as well, because you're not going to be strong in the end range, uh, right out of the gate. You're just going to have to lower your weights and gradually build up that strength in the end range. You'll see more hypertrophy. Uh, Schoenfeld, again, has done many studies on this uh, with multiple different joint angles in the body, whether it's quadriceps or triceps or biceps. Um, when you get uh, into a stretch position, you're going to see more hypertrophy overall, and you're going to see more hypertrophy in the end ranges. So if you're looking to get more uh, mass around closer to the knee on the quadricep, uh, then you're going to want to maximize that range of motion as best you can. And sometimes if the limiting factor again is, is calf flexibility or ankle mobility, then you're going to want to use an angle plate so you can get that knee out over the toe and just be focused on trying to stretch that quad as much as possible. Hmm. That's frustrating for me because I, I do want to uh, train. I do want to train at the most lengthened position uh, just because knees over toes guy, I have some joint issues and it would be nice to strengthen myself there. But uh, I'm actually yeah. really trying to focus on growing my quads in the center position because I have, like you said, long biceps. I have long quads. So like my teardrop looks big. The very bottom of my sweep looks big. But then I lift all my shorts up and I feel like the leg looks kind of straight. 
You know what I mean? Whereas you have people with legs like Joe Aesthetics, where it's just like this giant like sea of like a quad, just massive in the middle. Yeah. Well, uh, what was his name? Dennis Wolf had an, an extraordinarily uh, huge sweep in his lateralis, and some of that's genetic. There's not a lot you can do. Uh, but Flex Wheeler had relatively narrow quadriceps at the knee, uh, but he he created the illusion of a sweep by maximizing his uh, adductor and hamstring growth. And so it, it may be, if you ever watch Flex, you'll notice that, that at the knee, he's, he's very small at the knee. And then you'll notice that, that he touches his adductors together. And that's where most of the illusion of sweep came from, not the lateralis. And that was his genetic predisposition. So he trained, when I trained with him, he had us do good girl, bad girls uh, on every, at the end of every leg day. We did a lot of adductor work. Uh, because he wanted to to uh, get as much as we ca- could out of the appearance of the, the leg sweep. And so some people uh, will look pretty straight up and down, and they may not have the genetic predisposition to build a, a big lateralis sweep like Dennis Wolf, but they could uh, maybe, uh, through developing the adductor, uh, create a nice uh, look for their legs that way. Okay, I see Nice. So what about partial reps then? Would you recommend if I wanted to try to build a little bit more of the center position of my quad, would you recommend like say more partial rep, like leg extensions? We, we, we don't see that as compared to full length, full range of motion. Uh, I didn't want to leave the impression that the partial rep gave you more growth than a full rep in the middle of the muscle. It doesn't give you more growth. Um, so I, I, now, would maybe you finish a set when you've maxed out your end range and you still think you've got a couple more reps in you, maybe you shorten the range of motion, finish a couple reps. And I mean, that, that's all fine and good. Uh, generally speaking, when, when you've uh, failed at end range, uh, you've maximized your hypertrophy stimulus and you can uh, you know, wait to another set or wait for the next workout to keep compounding that over time. Okay, gotcha. Cool. That's, that's some interesting info. So, yeah, I've got a chart in, I, I have the vertical diet ebook that I've had out for a number of years now. That's uh, evolved from the vertical diet 1.0 to the 2.0 mm-hmm. to the 3.0. And I put a evidence-based guidelines for hypertrophy chart. That's actually something that was created by uh, the glute guy, Brett Contreras, right, PhD. Yep. And yep. he did a fantastic job of going over all of the details that we just discussed so that you can, read through it in very short order and optimize every aspect of your workout such that it, it lends itself best to, you know, gives you the best return on investment. You control all the var- variables that can be controlled as we just covered. And it's a nice uh, little chart that I put in the ebook for folks. And when people ask me about these very same questions, I send them the chart because it is multifactorial and you would like to optimize each of those different areas. Nice. Yeah. I love his work. Um, he's a, he's a funny guy. <laughs> we were actually, um, he doesn't that. we were actually like, uh, we were actually together a few weeks ago for, uh, one of my friends shows WBFF shows here. Um, but <laughs> he's, he's, he's hilarious. <laughs> he's great. And he'll tell you and Schoenfeld will tell you and, and everybody will tell you Mike Gizriel tell Lee Norton. They'll all tell you that look, all of the stuff we just just discussed is important. Uh, but at the end of the day, intensity. You, you're just going to have to continue to train very, very hard if you want to, to provide a sufficient stimulus for the body to respond to. Uh, there's, just, there's, no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's no hacks or gimmicks or tricks. You're really going to have to knuckle down. And, and like I said, I'll spend... Uh, an extraordinary amount of time and energy preparing for a one hour bout of training. And I have to make sure that that one hour is as productive as possible Uh, and training hard. uh, And I'm not talking about junk volume. I'm talking about battle ropes and burpees. I'm not talking Mm -hmm. about sweating and breathing hard. That's, that's not the driver of hypertrophy. I'm talking about intensity. How close do you get from failure? And are you controlling that weight through a great range of motion? And then, uh, you know, are you progressing that over time? that's that's the bottom line if you're chit-chatting buddies most of the time and and uh you know 
worried more about your Instagram post and, and the, you just aren't gutting out a, at least a few grueling sets every workout. Uh, it's, it's a good chance you're going to uh, stagnate pretty quick. I agree with that. So if you don't mind me uh, moving on to this this other topic, I actually saw on Vigor Steve's podcast that you mentioned um, something regarding your, your dose of test during building your your greatest feats of strength. If you don't mind if I move on or if I ask about this. Oh, not at all. Go ahead. But yeah, so okay, I think I'm not quite sure, but I'm pretty sure that it was something along the lines of you mentioning maybe 500 milligrams of test as you were preparing for like your your highest lifts. Do you remember if that's what it was? Actually, it was two separate conversations. We spent over an hour talking. One was what I used back in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is a small town boy from Oregon, didn't have access to a lot of stuff. And I was, and Dorian Yates spoke about this himself back in the late 80s when uh, they were just using a CC a test. And then when they went to two CCs a test, they thought it was a really big deal. And that was my point. Back in the early 90s, I can remember, I specifically remember going from one CC of Sustanon a week to two CCs of Sustanon a week. And really thinking that that I was, um, you know, I was endangering my health, and I was, mm. I was gonna. I remember, I, I think that I said I thought I was gonna shit a liver or something like that. We thought that was a big deal back then, which is mm. laughable by today's standards. Mm -hmm. So, and my point was is that I got up to three hundred pounds in nineteen ninety five. Nineteen ninety five, I got up to three hundred pounds, and I was using two cc's of sustenon. And if it were available uh, around a meet, we'd use about uh, 20 milligrams. I think they were 10 milligram tablets, maybe two of them, of Dianabol for like 30 days before a meet. And uh, I was pretty strong. I totaled 2,000 pounds. I was benching 560. I was squatting mid 700s. I was deadlifting 780. Uh, this was all back in 1994. Uh, and I got up to 300 pounds in 1995 on two cc's of sustenance uh, and some D-ball, and I got really strong. And that's the fact. That's what I used. That's all we had. All of my training partners were in about the same range. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I, my point was is that I focused a lot on eating and sleeping, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of calories, Mm -hmm. And too many calories. I overfed. I, I dirty bulked. I was eating ice cream and pizzas. And, <laughs> uh, I ended up somewhat unhealthy. My <laughs> blood test showed I, uh, I had some compromised metabolic marker. Um, but my point was is that uh, a little bit of test and 500 milligrams a week is not a little bit. That's a substantial amount. You can, you know, with the right amount of training and a lot of food, uh, you can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wouldn't want anybody to think that they needed a gram of test or two grams. You just don't. And, and you know, I've trained, I can't mention their names, but I've trained with some, some world-class power lifters who, who have even used less than that and uh, been extraordinarily strong. You know, uh, genetics reigns supreme in that mm -hmm. regard. Um, and then I took a hiatus from 1997 to 2006. I did not compete. I was building my companies. I, I moved and, started some businesses and uh, was trying to build those up and I didn't compete. Uh, I didn't use any steroids from 1997 to 2006. I did not use any testosterone. I didn't compete. Um, and I was hypogonadal. I, I had low T uh, due to varicocele diagnosed at 20 and was oh put God. on HRT at the time. And so uh, I felt miserable. And looking back on it, I didn't know the things I know now about hormones and, and the right. like, you know, we were, uh, we were hacks in the early nineties. We just, you know, whatever we, so you read in the magazine or something. You didn't have any HRT. You didn't have access to the information we have today. Mm -hmm. So for nearly 10 years, I didn't use anything. I wasn't competing and I wasn't big uh, during that time. And, and for, I think, one point, almost two years there when I was starting my company, I didn't train at all. I talked about that in a, a, a video called Stress for Success uh, on my YouTube video. Where I talked about the fact that I'd gotten down to like 210 pounds and I was tired and I was weak and uh, in retrospect, a lot of that could have been mitigated with just a little bit of TRT because I was, I was hypogonadal. My testosterone was probably, uh, in, in the eighties or which is where it was tested when I was 20, I was, I think 120 or, or somewhere around there, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I initially started TRT when I was 20. Uh, and then I just went ape shit because I wanted to compete and get huge. And so, 
And the doctor recommended like 100 milligrams a week. And next thing you know, I was doing 500 milligrams a week. Uh, but it was a slow process and, and uh, I gained a ton of weight and size and strength doing it. It's, it's enough. That's my point of that whole conversation from somebody who looks back now. Well, then in 2006, I came back and did a couple of small cycles and won the Emerald Cup. In 2008, I uh, did the Emerald Cup again. Um, and when I say small cycles, I, I mean, we're, you're talking bodybuilding prep stuff. You're talking a little bit of test probe, a little bit of master on. Uh, I talked specifically about what I used with Flex Wheeler in 2009. It was 100 milligrams of test probe every other day, 100 milligrams of master on every other day, uh, 50 milligrams of Winstrol a day. Um, that was my pre-contest cycle and, uh, it was very extraordinarily effective. Uh, uh, one or two, I used a GH at the time as, uh, as I recall, um, that was, I mean, that was probably the best I ever was, was on that program with Flex Wheeler. And it wasn't, it wasn't a lot of stuff. Um, uh, well, and then powerlifting, uh, you know, I went out and trained with Mark Bell and I wanted to beat uh, world records. Uh, and I, I started, the doses started climbing from there. And that's when I started using 750 milligrams test, 750 milligrams DECA, 750 milligrams EQ, uh, and bumped my D ball up to about 50 milligrams for two weeks and then hundred milligrams for a week or two. The problem with the orals was I'd always lose my appetite. So I couldn't take very much for very long. Uh, it would completely crash my appetite, but that was, uh, the, probably the max dose. And then, uh, the following year I did that cycle again for the world's strongest pro bodybuilder, but I threw in super draw. Uh, and I was miserable. My blood markers were horrendous. Mm. It's the exact conversation I had with Steve. Of course, people saw the clip where I talked about using, you know, going from one CC a test to two CCs a test back in the early 90s, and people uh, didn't watch the whole video, and they thought that's what I was talking about. <laughs> and what's sad when you look back is I totaled 2,000 pounds as a, you know, as a, a really, uh, I wasn't a very, I hate to use the word good power lifter. I wasn't very knowledgeable about powerlifting in the mid nineties. I was just a strong bodybuilder. Um, and, uh, you know, I totaled 2000 pounds and uh, I ultimately totaled 22, 26 with Mark Bell u- using, you know, four times as much stuff. Uh, but the bulk of the gains that I made was from a significant change in my squat form. Uh, that's what went up the most. I deadlifted 782 in 1993 on two cc's a test. And I think I deadlifted around the same when I totaled 2226. I think it was around 770 something. I did pull an 826 or an 827 one time, but that's not a huge jump from 1993 to 2012 to go from 782 to uh, 827. Not a big jump. Um, same with the bench press. I think I benched 560 in 1993, 1994, and uh, a 606 in 2012. Um, the squat was the big difference. I think I squatted low 700s in 1993, 1995. Uh, but I was utilizing kind of a narrower stance squat and I was dropping down quite deep. There's a video of me in 2009 totaling 20, totaling 2070, uh, where I walked out and buried a squat. I mean, ass to heels, and it was a grinder, and my feet were probably not even shoulder width apart. Mark changed me to a much wider stance, and I had a lot less forward lean. Uh, I was able to bring the bar up just a little bit higher, kind of the way Larry Wheels squats. You notice how his, his bar is not really a, a traditional low bar and his uh, torso isn't bent forward very uh, horizontally. He keeps a reasonably high torso. And we, we squat similarly where we just kind of balance the bar halfway between a high bar and a low bar. I do the same thing. Uh, too. Yeah, if I get too low, then the heavy weights, I, I would, it would crush me. It would bend my thoracic over. Uh, same. And if I get too high, uh, there's too much knee over toe and I don't have the strength. And so Mark brought my stance way out. And I went from like a 765 squat in 2009 in, say, March at that meet where I totaled 2070 to an 854. Holy shit. I think 821 
an 821 and then ultimately an 854 with no knee wraps. Oh my God. Uh, so I probably gained a hundred pounds on my squat. That was probably the big game changer. Wow. The difference, the huge difference was, was, and I would attribute that mostly to technique, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Not, you know, I got something out of the dosages, but uh, most certainly Ronnie Coleman talked about this years ago. And look, I just, I just, I just talk about what I did uh, and, and what I, in retrospect, what I think it did for me so that others, uh, you know, just have an opportunity to assess their own mm -hmm. uh, history or maybe uh, what they decide to do in the future. Ronnie told me uh, one time, and, I, and he's spoken about it publicly as well. He didn't gain a lot of strength when he started adding in uh, uh, a lot of steroids and growth hormone, et cetera. Um, he was already a power lifter, very strong power lifter. And he said his strength didn't go up that much, right? But his size, did. yes, the right. volumizing of the muscles, those larger doses seem to do a lot more mm. for building, uh, muscle, muscle size mass. than right. strength. And that's not to say that they don't benefit with strength. You know, there's, there's certainly a bigger muscle can become a stronger muscle, but it, I don't think it's as significant in, in the differences, the percentage of difference between, uh, as it is with bodybuilding, mm -hmm. it's cartoonish what you can do with, with bodybuilding doses of, uh, uh, of anabolics. It's, it can be cartoonish. So that's, that's kind of what we talked about. And I think people watch portions of those interviews or they see something that was a clip that was posted on Instagram and they just started going ape shit. It's I, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no way, that's all you use, blah, blah, blah. It's like, listen to the whole interview. Okay. Yeah. No, and, and I, yeah, I still wanted people to, to recognize the fact that, uh, that you can get, a, you can make a lot of progress without taking two plus grams a gear a week. I, mm -hmm. I, I was no stronger at the world's strongest pro bodybuilder when I weighed 305 pounds, no stronger, probably a little weaker, to be honest with you, than I was weighing 275 on a lower dose, uh, not low by 90 standards, um, at weighing 275 uh, competing with Mark Bell. And so I, I just don't think it's necessary after a certain point for people to uh, completely abandon their health markers. Uh, and that's why I got blood tests every month uh, before competitions, after competitions, all throughout the year, over 100 tests over the course of a decade. Uh, so I could see what uh, certain protocols were doing for my body. The biggest difference I noticed is that every time I lost weight, my biomarkers improved significantly. Uh, that, that was one of the huge differences. Mm -hmm. And then paying attention to liver health and kidney health, right. those things are always critical. And that's what I do with the big athletes I train. I just talked to another uh, world's strongest man athlete this morning uh, about the very same thing that uh, they notice as the years progress, they start accumulating more and more visceral fat and they start suffering from worse and worse biomarkers, uh, metabolic syndrome, higher blood pressure, higher blood sugar, higher lipids, uh, fatty liver. Uh, that's very common. Uh, we see it in, you know, most uh, power lifters as they get up in weight classes, 275, 308 and above, uh, sleep apnea, those kinds of things. And uh, I just think people could uh, still perform just as well, but pay attention to those those markers and have a much longer, healthier career. Here I am at I 55. I put my body through hell. There were times in my career where I took a lot more than, than I should have. Um I think fortunately in retrospect, I say this now, which is what I apply to all my big athletes. I periodized my weight simply because I competed in powerlifting and then turned around and dieted down for bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. So I was losing, you know, 40 pounds, sometimes 50 pounds, uh, twice a year to diet down to bo a bodybuilder and just the weight loss itself and then increasing volume and frequency. So I was just more cardiovascularly fit, uh, that extended my career rather than hanging out at a very heavy weight with a compromised blood pressure and, 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 uh, and cholesterol all damn year. Uh, that's, this is why I bring, uh, with a lot of my big power lifters, I'll bring their weight down in the off season, try and get them to lose about 7% of their body weight. We brought Hofthor from 440 down to 395, uh, and then took him back up. But we, we took him back up with, uh, doing a host of things, less saturated fat, implementing the CPAP usage, more things like choline and Tudka and NAC for the liver. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. we had a host of different things that we were doing to try and make sure that when he gained the weight back, 
that uh, it, it was uh, not accumulating as much liver fat, uh, which is the primary driver of all that those metabolic syndrome problems. Well, just about that real though, I just think it's, you know, there's always going to be those uh, the freaking keyboard trolls, especially when you have like reels like that and shorts. But I mean, the first thing that I thought about when I saw that was, um, I wish I had the exact paper to tell you, but I recall reading a paper that was stating that um, when they titrated 500 milligrams of testosterone above 500 milligrams, they saw linear increases in muscle gain, but not no longer did they see those increases in strength. The strength about plateaued around 500 milligrams. So when everyone's like claiming, oh, like these things about numbers, oh, this guy's like only running 500 milligrams of test. I was just like, it's, it's always going to be the people that aren't very educated. And uh, they just read the Reddit forums and they see that bodybuilders are running three grams of gear. So everybody needs to be running three grams of gear, which is absolutely cap. That's just going to run you into the ground instead of like giving you a good long career. Yeah, people confuse side effects with effects. 500 milligrams of test a week, is a, that's a damn good, I mean, that's a lot of test. You, pr- probably your testosterone levels would be north of 2,000 with that. Uh, it'd be very effective. Um there was another study that people started pointing out whenever uh, they were talking about when I said that I said in an interview once that testosterone just by itself doesn't work. You have to have sufficient calories and protein. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes throughout my career, I would hear people talking about, you know, if I took what he took or if I just got my finances <laughs> together and I could afford to do that. And, you know, my biggest problem with that is if, if you think the difference between you where you are now and where you want to be is, uh, you know, after a certain point, let's say 500 milligrams of test a week. If you think the difference between where you are now and where you want to be is going from 500 milligrams of test to two grams of test a week. Uh, I don't think you'll ever be successful because I don't think the difference between those two is as big as people would like to think, or if they had more money and they could afford as much growth hormone and da 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 da. I just, even the old schoolers would say, you know, just a little test in D-ball, you know, uh, uh, if you can't grow on that, you're not probably not going to grow. The reason why I try and bring this stuff up is because generally speaking, it's not because you're not taking enough shit or the perfect stack or the right, you know, combination things. Generally, it's because you're not eating enough food or training hard enough, yeah. generally, or sleeping enough. There's, those are the bigger controllable factors. And sometimes these guys go from taking 500 milligrams a week to 1,000 to 2,000 and don't get much better because they never fixed what was really the problem in the first place. Uh, I never competed in a drug-tested event. I competed against guys who used performance-enhancing drugs. Now, how is it that I surpassed all of them? We were all using the same stuff. Some people used more. Some people used less. And I don't think the difference between me and someone else or someone else and, and me is – the difference between 500 or a thousand milligrams a week. I don't think that's the difference. I think the difference is, is uh, I was um, ADHD OCD on eating, sleeping and training. That was, uh, it's all I did. Mm -hmm. I was was so unbelievably committed to it. And it was at the sacrifice of, of a lot of other things in my life, you know, up until I was over 30 years old, I, I didn't have a pot to piss in. All I did was eat, sleep and train. That was it. And then I had to completely get away from, from competing, competing and training because I'm, I'm the kind of person, as I say, I'm OCD, uh, ADHD. I, I just, I'll pour myself into something. I said, you could be great at anything, but you can't be great at everything. And so I just completely stopped competing and I've started uh, a company, uh, two companies. And I spent the next 10 years building, a, uh, building up my businesses. I built five multi-million dollar companies in the last uh, 20 years. And then... In 2006, when I came back to competing, I was 38 years old. Uh, I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have kids. I didn't have to work. I had money. I had time. Uh, I went and hired Flex Wheeler, the best uh, you know coach in, on the planet. Uh, and that's all I did was eat, sleep, and train. I lived in a, a extended stay across the street from the gym. We trained twice a day. I ate seven times a day. I slept nine hours a night, napped every afternoon. And, and <laughs> that's all I did. And I did a video on YouTube called why I'm a hypocrite. And that's why I'm a hypocrite because not everybody has the time and the resources 
uh, to be able to do that. But at the end of the day, that's what matters most, not whether or not you took two cc's or four cc's of test, is my point. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've beaten a lot of guys over the years who have taken a lot more stuff. Uh, there's no question in my mind. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's because they didn't pay enough attention to the, the big rocks, which to me was uh, just the consistent and constant obsessive uh, discipline of uh, of the training and eating and sleeping. Right. I mean, the fact is we have all the anecdotal proof out there that no one really wants to look at because they just want to imagine that if I if someone took more of something, then that's probably the reason they're what they are. But when it comes down to it, yeah. for me, I want to add something to that. That's not just you know the food and sleep, but I think one of the most important factors people underlook is programming, just proper programming. Um, and yes. I can say that especially from my experience because the last 15 years of training, I would just blow my brains out of the gym and I thought that was enough. I would blow my brains out of the gym yeah. and... Um, Sometimes I would eat enough calories, but a lot of the time there's definitely periods of time where I could have eaten a lot more, but I just wanted to stay lean. So now that I'm following proper programming, I'm realizing there's so many things that I overlooked. Warming up, like five steps of warming up, you know, doing a little bit of like cardio, a little bit of fast movement, some uh, mobility and yeah. stuff, all these things before you actually hit your your workout. Um, what else? Just... Uh, meal timing, you know, even just carbohydrate t- timing around your workout and then making sure I'm getting enough rest and I'm not fatiguing myself. I've, o- I was always over fatiguing myself, um, in the gym and then, you know, wondering why I wasn't making strength. Agreed. And I just think that's so important. Yeah. And that's why I refer people to those evidence-based guidelines of our hypertrophy chart. And we talked so much about that in this, in this video. I'll say one more thing, uh, uh, regarding the performance enhancing drugs that, uh, this was the, the trope that a lot of people responded to on that little brief video. They said, when I said that steroids don't make you grow in the absence of, you know, sufficient calories and protein, uh, some people were saying, well, there's a study that shows that people who took steroids, but didn't even train built muscle. And I said, yeah, uh, I'm very familiar with the studies, multiple studies. They were overfeeding studies. All of them were overfeeding studies. These were 170 pound guys taking 600 milligrams of testosterone a week, eating over 3,000 calories a day with 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. The point is, is it was an overfeeding study. And as long as you get sufficient food and protein, then steroids can work because that's what they do. They increase nitrogen retention. They turn food and protein into muscle, mm. whether you train or not. Uh, but you have to eat enough. And that was kind of my the point I was trying to get at is that you can keep taking more and more and more and more gear but if you don't have the bricks to build the building, meaning if you're not eating enough food and getting sufficient protein, uh, then obviously the training stimulus is going to uh, be, uh, you know, give you even more results. But that was the point of the conversation: is that most people at some point in their career just aren't eating enough, and you need to have sufficient calories. It's one of the biggest challenges with. Uh, the big guys that I train is that it's just hard for them to continue to eat enough food to support the monstrous, uh, both their mass and their workload. You see this with strong men, football linemen, they have a hard time maintaining their weight because they do two a days. They weigh 320, 330 pounds. They're very mm-hmm. muscular. That requires, in many cases, six, 7,000 calories a day. That's very hard to do, uh, particularly with a healthy diet that's not just laden with uh, pizzas and uh ice cream yeah so uh, which will very quickly you know compromise your health and and give you fatty liver and high blood pressure so that was my point is that if you want to grow don't sit around whining about how somebody else is taking more gear than you uh figure out how to get your diet in order and as long as you're in a calorie surplus uh just 200 300 400 500 milligrams a week all of which to me is pretty modest uh, you should be able to to grow on that. Nicely said. Nicely said, man. Um, so let's move on to nutrition real quick. Uh, with a vertical diet, sure. I know that you cover a lot of the best food choices, just like you were saying about managing your blood work and your biomarkers that will you know optimize not just macronutrient profiles for our best body composition, but also micronutrients for you know health and longevity and even like sports performance. So can you like give me a little quick overview at least for the audience regarding like what kind of food profiles you have um laid out in your books and then what kind of things markers you hit uh one thing i kind of want to go on especially would be like apob 
Yeah, I spent an hour talking with Mark Bell recently on his podcast about uh, cardiovascular disease. Let's go. Let's start from the top. First and foremost, calories are king. If you want to gain weight, you have to be in a calorie surplus. If you want to lose weight, you have to be in a calorie deficit. Uh, next up, we talk about macros, uh, protein being the most important of that. Uh, you want to get sufficient protein in order to build muscle. Not an extraordinary amount. A gram of protein per pound of lean weight or goal weight uh, is usually plenty. If somebody's trying to lose weight, I might actually increase their protein just because it's satiating. It has a higher thermic effect of food, meaning mm -hmm. uh, you burn about 30% of those calories just uh, metabolizing the protein. So you net out uh, fewer total calories from protein than you would net out from fats or carbs. So uh, you can eat a little more food and uh, net out fewer calories if, if, uh, if you have a lot of protein. Uh, I, sufficient fats are important, obviously, for sleep, for hormones, those kinds of things. But uh, sufficient is somewhere around 15% of total calories would be the bottom end. Um, so I, I top out at about 30%. Uh, and as people are dieting, that's what I start to lower. I start to lower fats first, down to 25%, then 20% of total calories. Usually it's about half or less grams of proteins. So if you're a 200-pound person taking in... 180 grams of protein, then you want to take in about 90 grams of fat. Actually, I would. That, uh, uh, if I might chime in for a second, I actually wanted to ask you this. So, do you have any perception on, uh, say, a, a natural user versus an enhanced user? There's a lot of, uh, you know, bodybuilding bro science out there about the amount of protein you should be consuming. But then again, there is like an increase in muscle mass that you tend to uptake whenever you're using PEDs properly. So, what? Yeah, I think just the opposite. Uh, just the opposite is true. We see is that because testosterone increases nitrogen retention and, and efficiency, protein efficiency, you could eat less protein and get away with it, right? And, and and get away with it. And that's not to say if you eat more, you can build more muscle faster. There's still a limit to the amount of uh, the, the rate at which you can add muscle. And it doesn't take a lot of protein to build muscle. It just it takes sufficient calories first and foremost. It's really hard to build muscle without uh, a calorie surplus, particularly for an experienced lifter. Uh, so I would I would still focus on calories, and I don't think that that loading protein, even when on anabolic steroids, is going to make you grow any faster. Uh, I would contend that you could you could actually eat less uh, on anabolic steroids and still get the same growth, uh, just because it's so much more efficient protein efficiency nitrogen retention. Uh, so, you know, once we get past, once we fix our protein and fats, uh, and I generally base that on weight uh, or total protein intake as opposed to a percentage of total calories. Cause if somebody's in a significant calorie deficit, I still want to get uh, protein around um, 0.8 grams per pound or a gram per pound of lean weight. Uh, so if a 200 pound person is taking 180 grams of protein, 90 grams of fat or thereabouts, and they could go a little lower in fat if they wanted to, the rest is carbs. Mm -hmm. and you base that on your total caloric intake. If you want mm -hmm. to be in a surplus, then uh, then you're going to want to, you know, make sure you fill in the rest with carbs. You can be in a deficit. Same thing. Now, for people trying to lose weight, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're high carb, low carb. We have equivalent uh, weight loss outcomes. Uh, it's really a matter of personal preference and what diet you can adhere to at that point. Same is true with things like intermittent fasting uh, or uh, you know, any diet that has dietary restrictions, like eliminating particular food items. It's, uh, really at this point, it's about satiety. Do you feel satiated with the current foods that you're eating? And so now we start to look at, as mentioned earlier, um, proteins, pretty satiating fibers, pretty satiating. There's high satiety, whole foods in general, as compared to ultra processed foods, whole foods are pretty satiating ultra processed foods, not, not very satiating. We tend to over consume those. Uh, to the tune of about 500 calories a day if we're eating fast food and processed foods. Um, so I try and build that carbohydrate foundation first and foremost to include uh, potassium-rich sources, potato, fruit, uh, because potassium is so critical to performance. It's uh, uh, fantastic for uh, digestion, blood sugar control, uh heart regulation, your sodium potassium pump. There's so many things that potassium is good for. And it's kind of hard to get enough of it. And so um, whether gaining or losing weight, the first, the carbohydrates I lead with are potassium rich carbs, potatoes, twice as much potassium as banana fruits. Um, 
protein sources, I don't mean to backtrack here, but protein sources, a variety of lean sources. Uh, generally, um, if you want to keep your fats uh, down where I recommend them, then you can't be eating butter, bacon, and ribeyes because you're going to blow your fat calories out of the door right, right away. So I'm using leaner meats, top sirloin steak, uh, bison or 96.4 beef, egg, egg white blends. I like to keep the yolk or two in there because of the choline and the biotin, all mm-hmm. the important uh, nutrients in, in egg yolks. Uh, and then fat-free Greek yogurt is uh, extraordinary. Uh, it's, uh, you see on both sides of the aisle, whether you're vegetarian or, or, or omnivore, uh, they recognize the, the gut health benefits of uh, fermented foods and probiotics and yogurt's a fantastic source of that. It's cardioprotective. Uh, there's just so many benefits to yogurt. And, uh, and then salmon at least twice a week for the omega-3. So those are my protein sources, lean meats. You can throw chicken in there. I don't demonize any particular food. I just don't enjoy chicken personally. Mm-hmm. And um, I have to eat a decent amount of calories. And so I'm, I'm sticking with a 96-4 ground beef. And I, because it's just easier to chew and swallow and digest so I can eat more of it and, and be hungry again sooner. And that's kind of where I diverge here. I go one direction for people who are trying to gain weight. I've got to find foods that they can eat a lot of and, and that don't bother their stomach. Um, and so I'm making the monster mash with bone broth and rice and bison. So they can just spoon a lot of that in at one sitting and then and it sits well on the stomach. And so they can eat again in three to four hours as needed. Uh, I use, uh, say, uh, orange juice instead of oranges because it's less satiating. Uh, I might even mix the yogurt in the orange juice with some ice and uh, make like a taste kind of like an orange uh, uh, cream sickle. It's pretty delicious. <laughs> orange juice has a whole host of health benefits. It lowers LDL. It lowers uh, inflammation. It, uh, um, uh, it, it uh, uh, decreases uh, uh, C-reactive protein, uh, lowers ALT enzymes in the liver. So uh, Juices in general, polyphenols, flavonoids, those are all great. I think people should eat plenty and plenty of fruit. Um, so that's kind of the foundation of, uh, of, of the diet. And if you're trying to lose weight, I'm working on satiety. So I'm eating oranges and potatoes because mm-hmm. they're high satiating. Plenty of, pro- plenty of uh, uh, protein and uh, throw in, say, a salad at night, a low-calorie skinny salad uh, just to so you have something to munch on. I have to get rid of all of the high calorie snacks out of the house and then replace them with something that's low calorie. It's really mm-hmm. important to have an alternative or you're just going to, you know, go binge somewhere. So, uh, Lay Norton eats a lot of popcorn when you're dieting, you know, and that's not the popcorn you get at Costco with coconut oil. That's uh, 2000 calories a bag. Right. Uh, it's, it's an air pop popcorn with a little bit of salt. Um, I like a product I, called I Bill Tong. Too. Uh, yeah. Bill what? Tong is a jerky. That's really low calorie, low fat, low sugar. Uh, so now you get the you get a high protein. You get the you get a chew on something, uh, and then fat free Greek yogurt and fruit, blueberries, strawberries. I mean, you can eat a pound of strawberries that has like 120 calories, uh, as compared to any other snack that you might have at home, whether it's chips or ice cream. You can hardly have you know 10 chips or a, a spoonful of ice cream, and you're already at 120 calories. So. Um, have alternatives available that allow you to, to satisfy your mastication desire sitting there and chewing while you watch TV or whatever, <laughs> but, and not overloading yourself with, with, uh, with just calories. Mm-hmm. So, uh, have alternatives, have a good right. strategy, we drink, you know, for weight loss, we drink tons and tons of fluids, uh-huh. especially with meal it really helps stretch out the rugae of the stomach, which uh, notifies the brain, Hey, I'm, I'm full, I'm stretched out. It could be iced tea. It could be uh, Coke Zeros. I don't care. We do the same strategy. We go to restaurants, just load up on on drinking iced teas and uh, and, and diet sodas, so that you're inclined to eat less. And then order the salad with no dressing and some uh, some protein on top, salmon or steak mm-hmm. or chicken. Uh, those are always good good ways to to stay adherent to your diet using all the. Uh, I have a whole list of satiety tips, uh, hierarchy of uh, from. Uh, uh, best to right. most effective to least effective that people could kind of put in their toolbox to, because, you know, managing hunger is the most important thing for weight loss. As soon as you get hungry, you know, willpower is not a good strategy for weight loss. You'll lose that battle every time your body will fight you and you'll end up overeating if you aren't utilizing, uh, uh more than one of these satiety strategies. Mm-hmm. 
I'm a I'm a fat ass, and I just I, I like even on my bulk, even when I'm eating like over three thousand calories. For some reason, after I eat a meal, I'm like I feel like even if my stomach is full, I can continue eating through that meal. It's like it just spikes my like parasympathetic response, and I just want to just kill, just keep feeding my my face. And your thing of walking ten minutes after each meal in order to uh, reduce blood glucose and help digestion has actually also helped me like just stop eating. <laughs> and then that way, like I, yeah. it's like, I almost get like through that digestion. Um, I almost like get a little bit back into a regular, like sympathetic response rather than a parasympathetic. And it's like easier for me to not continue eating. Absolutely. Yeah. The 10 minute walk is, uh, is life changing and it, it helps people, uh, with satiety who are trying to diet. And it helps people increase their appetite who are trying to gain weight. It's, it's, it's amazing how it works on both sides of the equation. Uh, it helps with digestion, helps with blood sugar control, as you mentioned. Um, uh, it's, uh, and it's also the most important thing about it is, is it's sustainable. If I get a client and I attempt to prescribe them some cardio, they have to get in the car, have to get changed, get in the car, drive to the gym, get on a machine – the likelihood of them sustaining that behavior for any extended period of time is very low. It's not very effective. It's not very enjoyable. It's not very sustainable. Uh, and when I say it's not very effective, I mean that your body adapts over time and, and starts burning less calories for the amount of time invested into the same exercise. It becomes more efficient. Uh, and secondarily, maybe even more importantly, you experience what's called compensation and the more, uh, exercise activity, the more, you know, battle ropes and burpees and, and you know, tr trying just to burn calories to lose weight, the more of that you do, uh, compensation takes over, which is uh, um, a phenomenon where you end up just sitting more and eating more because you get tired and hungry. And so the actual net benefit of the exercise activity at the end of the day is much less than, than some people would presume. Uh, because you end up doing less non-exercise activity and you end up moving or eating. And so you, you, it's called compensation. And so the net effect is pretty small. That's why I like a lot of neat. I like the 10-minute walks. They're very sustainable. You can do them anywhere, anytime. They only take 10 minutes. And so, uh, you know, it's not as though you have to cancel an appointment or yeah. you can't still take the kids somewhere and then walk around wherever they're at, whether it's, it's the, you know, a practice or a park or you can be at the airport collecting your luggage uh, from or waiting at baggage claim and you can take a 10 minute walk around baggage claim. So there's so many opportunities to squeeze in a little 10 minute yeah. walk. You can go to a restaurant at night and uh, you leave the restaurant and you set your timer for your, your iPhone for five minutes and you start walking down the street. When it goes off, you walk back, then you get in your car. Little things like that uh, can really help. Uh, with more so than just accumulating the step count that's necessary. It's good for your cardiovascular fitness, obviously, but um, uh, obviously with the blood sugars and the appetite control, it's just, it's fantastic for your overall health. And now you've done all the cardio you need to do for the week. You don't have to do any planned cardio. You just go to the gym and do your lifting three, whatever times a week that you desire. Uh, I'm cautious to, to make sure when I assign training programs to people, I, I, I create something they enjoy. Uh, the best exercise is the one you'll do. And I don't want to give somebody... I don't, I don't assume that somebody likes to lift weights like I do, uh, but they do need to do some sort of resistance training in order to maintain lean mass and for good health span. Uh, and so I try and find some type of loading that they'll actually enjoy. And that might be, you know, picking through different machines at the gym. I don't assume everybody wants to squat, uh, <laughs> you know, finding different ways for them to be, I don't know, incentivized uh, by going to the gym and doing something that, that they, uh, that they can enjoy, or at least they think they're progressing on, uh, such as maybe just a trap bar deadlift. You know, those are easy to progress on over time. And it feels very rewarding to go in and, and trap bar 135 day one, and then 150 the next week, and then 170 the week after, and you're, you, you feel like you're making progress. Uh, you've probably heard the conversation on Instagram. I forget who said it, but if you go to the gym and you work out for an hour and you come home and look in the mirror, you'll see nothing. <laughs> You know, and that that can go on for many, many weeks, if not months for most people. You go to the gym and work out and come home, you see nothing in the mirror. Uh, but if you can attach uh, an incentive to strength, uh, you can see that you can you can actually quantify that in the gym. And people will feel as though they're making progress, mm -hmm. even in the absence of looking in the mirror and seeing an immediate change. 
uh, for the weight training, which, as we know, takes longer. Uh, you can lose weight and, and look a little better, but building muscle takes a little longer. But gaining strength, I mean, you could do that just right out of the gate, week after week after week mm-hmm. for an extended period of time. So I focus on that as the incentivizer. Okay, yeah. So insulin resistance is uh, definitely a micro, I'd say, for, for our number one killer, heart disease, right, over time. Um, so I'm wondering, say that someone's doing and implementing this 10-minute this walk, which I think is freaking phenomenal. Like, it's freaking awesome that this, this helps m- more than metformin. But if they were already doing this, what, were you, what are your thoughts on using berberine or metformin? Well, I think first and foremost, weight loss is to be the most important thing for improving insulin resistance. Um, you see the greatest effect size in terms of uh, lowering HbA1c, uh, lowering fasted glucose and fasted insulin, lowering triglycerides, uh, weight loss, even uh, reversing fatty liver disease. 7% weight loss can reverse 95% of fatty liver as tested with biopsy. So weight loss would be the number one focus. Um, Berberine in the absence of weight loss, uh, like metformin, you can see some improvement in blood sugars, but I think it's, um, uh, I think you're kicking the can down the road is what I think. I think that, that ultimately if you're beyond your personal fat threshold, which means that different people, uh, carry fat on their body in a different manner. Women tend to carry body fat subcutaneously in the hips and butt, et cetera. Uh, that doesn't seem to have as adverse an impact on your biomarkers, on your liver health and your blood sugars as carrying visceral fat around the belly, Mm -hmm. around the organs, around the liver, around the pancreas Mm -hmm. uh, and intramuscularly. Uh, Those fats are are particularly uh, hard on insulin resistance. And so uh, it's going to depend on the individual. We we look at that in terms of like waste measurement. That's why we, you know, on the uh, body mass index, we we really don't – uh, that can be significantly influenced by somebody's muscle mass. But if you combine that with a waist measurement, it give you a pretty good indicator. If your uh, you know, waist is over 40, 42 inches as a male, it's kind of a height to weight ratio. But uh, you probably are accumulating some, some organ fat. Uh, and it, if you've got a blood test, you might start to see some signs of that. Uh, you know, the leading indicators would be high triglycerides and high facet insulin. Lagging indicators would be your fasted glucose and HA1C. You know, those, uh, those may be in the normal range for 10 years or more while you're suffering from some degree of insulin resistance that's uh, identifiable by fasted insulin or triglycerides. So get a comprehensive blood panel and see if those things exist um, and then endeavor to try and lose weight rather than uh, – you know, I would never suggest that, that – I defer to your doctor as far as what you should be prescribed for medication. But um, uh, again, I think you're kicking the can down the road if you don't implement some sort of weight loss program. And even training muscles are a sink for glucose. So a lot of uh, strength athletes uh, have decent blood sugars uh, simply because they lift. They have so much muscle and they lift so often. Mm -hmm. Um, And the muscle will uptake glucose from the bloodstream without the need of insulin. insulin. So they may be you know, good, good, like triglycerides and HA1C. And, uh, but they may suffer from other problems, uh, such as high cholesterol, high LDL in particular, it will be, uh, and high blood pressure. Those would probably be much more common amongst people with, uh, uh, excess body fat, uh, in the competitive realm, super, uh, strong men, uh, power lifters and linemen and football, those kinds of folks. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So I have a, a list of questions from the audience, if you might be interested. Shoot. And yeah, let's do it. If it's okay, uh, I kind of want to try this thing where I jump on a live um, and have a question from the audience live. If you might let's be do it. Too. Okay, cool. What's up, guys? So we have a uh, Stan efforting on the podcast right now. So I'm wondering if any of you guys happen to have any questions that you guys would like to ask them. If you want to jump on with us. Yo, what's up, man? Pretty good, pretty good. So, did you have a question that you wanted to ask Stan? Stan? Yeah, well, basically I just wanted to ask about trend and why shouldn't you try it? Why, why, why you should try it or why what? Why you shouldn't try it. Why you shouldn't, okay. Did you happen to hear that? I did, yeah, I think it's very hard on the system. Remember I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, some people confuse side effects with effects 
And it, it certainly, like all anabolic steroids, it certainly will help uh, improve performance. Uh, but the challenge is, is that there's a, a lot of downsides to that, liver health, kidney health in particular. Uh, and I'll be honest, you know, I got the best effect using smaller amounts of trend pre-contest in bodybuilding for uh, just getting shredded. Uh, trying to use more in powerlifting, I just got really sick. Uh, you end up getting uh, insomnia and night sweats. Uh, psychologically, it's, it's uh, very stressful. So I only ever tried Tran in the off season in higher doses one time, and the side effects were such that I, uh, I abandoned it. Uh, but pre-contest, uh, we were using 37, we had 75 milligram ampules back then, so we were using half, 37.5 uh, every other day. Uh, and I thought it, it, finished, it finishes off a conditioned physique very nicely. Um, I, I think it is kind of a staple in, in the IFBB for professional uh, bodybuilding physique and, uh, you know, men's physique or classic, uh, because it, you really do seem to get that last little bit of hardness, kind of like what Winstrol would do is so you could do either or, but, I, uh, trend is commonly used, um, uh, pre-contest, but I don't think it needs to use, need to use very much. I think it has an extraordinary effect, uh, on an already lean physique. I think people try and lean into using too much, uh, pre-contest when they're out of shape. And at that point, nothing's going to help. Uh, you just, you just have to diet a little longer and get in better shape, uh, but it'll certainly help. It'll bring out the veins and, uh, kind of just get a kind of a hardened look to your physique. Um, so I think that is a good use for it, but I don't think the doses need to be very high. I, I wouldn't think you'd need to use more than, uh, I would say at most, uh, 300 milligrams a week would be, would be at a high end. I asked this question because my father is a bodybuilder. Okay. And he has been working out for about 50 years now. And he has a big, really huge body. And I recently found out that he has been using trend. Mm. So I have this feeling inside of me like if the body that I want isn't even achievable without using any other, other supplements and stuff. So why should I even try? And that is making me question my own thinking like do i even want to do bodybuilding anymore or do i not i love this question honestly because i know there's a lot of men out there that feel this yeah my concern is remember i talked to you about people having a longer horizon uh, it's a marathon not a sprint and oftentimes people look at trend as something like for short term i'm gonna i'm gonna take it to the next level in a very short period of time in a matter of months uh, and I don't feel that way about it. I, I don't think that it's any better than any other anabolic steroid over time in terms of its capacity to build muscle. Uh, I think it's particularly helpful pre-contest, as mentioned, to, to, to have a harder physique that's already really lean. Uh, my concern is, is that if you get blood tests uh, and beyond blood tests, if you get uh, uh, electrocardiogram and you look at... Um, you look at your heart condition and your left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, you look at those things. I think it compromises the endothelial lining, uh, which is the blood vessel lining, which makes you more susceptible to uh, atherosclerotic plaque buildup from, uh, you know, from uh, LDL, elevated LDL. Uh, those are things you can't see. Looking at somebody's physique, you don't see what's going on on the inside. And so uh, I would suggest... For anybody using any steroid, that you should get some comprehensive testing. I use Merrick Health, M-A-R-E-K, health.com. You can get an online blood test. You can go to stanefforting.com and, and, and click on blood test for $140. $140. A very comprehensive five-page blood test uh, that would tell you a lot about whether or not what you're using uh, is compromising your health. And I would, I would stay there and I would be patient and I would, wouldn't think that any, any specific single steroid is better for building muscle over the long term. Uh, uh, as mentioned with Trent, it, it might be helpful the last six to eight weeks before a bodybuilding show at finishing off a physique. But mm -hmm. I don't think it's any better than any other for building muscle right. long term. There's no evidence for that. Uh, I agree with him, um, and I have something to add on to that. Uh, he and I, Stan and I, actually just talked about this on the podcast, uh, that honestly, from what we've seen, taking the PEDs is people overblow, like 
to a great amount how much PEDs really affect your progress in the long run. Um, and it will have a, a, a somewhat linear um, relation with dosage as you increase dosages in terms of muscle size, but strength, however, plateaus at a certain point. And from my own experience as well, I've never taken Tren, and I don't know if I plan to, even for competing for Olympia, uh, simply because of the health repercussions it has. But you can make a, a beautiful physique, not just, you can make a beautiful physique off of, say, TRT, or say even something else, such as Prima Bolin, as well as just a beautiful physique being natural, but following like a smart program with intensity and calories and sleep. And people really, really undervalue that. It's just that it takes a long period of time. It takes years and years and years for sure. But you'd be surprised at how many gains you can make in 10 years, how you will be a completely different being. Um, thank you for this information. Thank you a lot, actually. And uh, I had just one small, small question that is taking, uh, will taking protein shakes actually help you gain it? Yeah, my, my input is that uh, protein shakes aren't needed. They're just for convenience. If you can get your meat or your protein from anything else, any other sources, it's probably better if it's a whole food source, but otherwise it really hardly makes any difference. It's just simply convenience. So I should basically just stick to my normal diet because I take meat a lot. So I think this could work easily. Yeah, yeah. If that's what you like doing, bro, just stick to that. Thanks, bro. Yeah, of course. Thanks for joining the call, man. Peace, guys. If you'd like to support the podcast through uh, funding, then you can use code Nile for Young Only Clothes or Huge Supplements. I heard the last question was uh, about protein powders. You've heard me say, somewhat jokingly, shakes are for fakes, eat steaks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, I just think protein is not really a supplement. Protein powder is food in a can. It's just convenient. Uh, I mm -hmm. prefer food because right. you get more micronutrients and it's more satiating. But, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you have a meal that is insufficient in protein or if you don't have access to a meal, it's a convenience thing. And if you want to have a shake here and there, nurses, you know, and police, fire and ambulance and, and stuff use these in a pinch when they don't have uh, uh, time or uh, means to get a full meal. They'll just have a protein shake. I think that's that's fine as a convenience item, but it's not anything that you would take in place of a meal if you had a, if you had that option, and it's not something that would work better than food. I I told them the exact same thing as well, that it's really simply convenience. Yeah, good. So uh, we got a few more questions. If you're uh, down to just answer yep. them real quick before Shoot. we wrap up, but uh, someone said, um, let's see, one person said. Uh, I fucked my knee from squats. Any suggestions to help make it stronger? I miss squatting. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, I would uh, Google pain in training, what to do by Austin Baraki at Barbell Medicine. I think these guys are on the, the I don't even want to call it cutting edge. They just, they have the best information on pain rehabilitation, uh, the most solid advice. It comes from Dr. Larimar Mosley's work explain pain out of Australia. The I have a video called Keys to Pain-Free Knees on YouTube where I talked about having chronic tendonitis and the injuries that I suffered throughout my career. It's kind of a three-step process. One, find a point of, well, one is eliminate the source. If you have something that's hurt or that hurt you or is hurting you, then eliminate it. Now that doesn't mean you can't squat or if your back got hurt, it doesn't mean you can't deadlift. It means you may need to shorten the range of motion and decrease the load. And that's what we call a point of entry. Find a point of entry at which you can start to resume movement of that joint with very little pain. What people tend to do is become what Greg Knuckles refers to as kinesophobic. When they get an injury, they stop moving. That's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. That will actually cause your recovery to be delayed. As compared to any type of manual therapy or passive therapy intervention. So let's say chiropractics, physical therapy, electric stem, ice, gua sha, I mean, you name it. Just you can go down the list. Any type of movement is far better than any passive therapy. I've said that things that are done to you or for you are never as effective as things you do for yourself. So think of passive therapies as things that people are doing to you. They're 
manually touching your knee or, or massaging it or they're putting an electric stem unit on it or they're icing it or, uh, you know, you name it. Any kind of therapy that's being done to you or for you is not as effective, not nearly as effective as you moving that affected area uh, as much as possible. There's a professor, Keith Barr, I believe, out of a Southern California college who recommends three bouts of movement spread apart by about six hours. This kind of goes down to the three 10 minute walks. If you find a, some sort of point of entry to where some range of motion and load that you can tolerate without pain, now you want to start moving that area as much as possible. We see this in, in collegiate and professional sports where somebody twists an ankle. Uh, they don't brace it. They get them onto uh, an underwater treadmill or they get them on a suspension harness and they get them moving it as quickly as possible so that you can start to remodel and, and heal the area. But it needs blood and that's going to happen from, from movement because your joints, uh, the cartilaginous structures in particular, aren't very well innervated with uh, capillaries. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's through movements of pressure. The, those joints are like little sponges, and when you move them, they, they squeeze out the bad stuff and soak in the good stuff. That's the blood flow. And the only way to do that is with movement. You moving, uh, not somebody moving the joint for you. You actually have to, have to contract the muscles uh, in order to get the blood into the area. So uh, Keith Barr said that uh, about six hours apart, uh, if it's a shoulder or a knee or whatever it is, Maybe you use a recumbent bike for the knee, let's say. And you get up in the morning and you do a, a, a little spin on a recumbent bike under modest tension, maybe 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off, and you do 10 of those. So it takes 10 minutes. Then you'd want to do that two more times that day. Do it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, let's say, about six hours apart. That would be the optimal uh, way to progress this over time. So what the barbell medicine folks would say is find a point of entry and then move, and then gradually over time, increasing volume first and then load, you just want to progress that injury by, as you would with any weight training program, you'd want to start to, to, to see if it, if you can, if it'll sustain load. So that is for any injury, hips, back, knees, shoulders, that's the one, two, three, eliminate the source, find a po point of entry, move early and often, uh, and progress it over time. Gotcha. Awesome. So someone asks, uh, on repeat again, asks, well, he actually says that uh, your diet literally saved his life. Just to pass oh, wow. on a thank you. So he owes you every yeah. heartbeat. That's great. <laughs> and then, thank uh, you. And then also, <laughs> would Stan be open to coach you or would you be open to Stan taking you on for one year plus diet? I would 100% be on for that. <laughs> oh, that's great. I don't know that I can help you, brother. You're doing great all by yourself. I got to tell you this, though. <laughs> Oftentimes, when I work with a great athlete, a Hofthor Bjornsson or a John Jones or, you know, a Lane Johnson from the Philadelphia Eagles, I always think to myself, how can I help this guy? He's one of the greatest athletes in the world. And after, you know, a conversation or two or a careful look, it, it seems that there's always something and it's usually something simple. It seems like some people are successful in spite of themselves. Uh, a lot of the big athletes aren't wearing CPAPs. To, to, uh, I was shocked. And it seems like their success, they just work through all of these challenges, you know, having to force feed themselves. I think more than anything, what I'm able to do with a lot of these guys is make it a little easier for them uh, and maybe improve their health such that it can lengthen their career. I don't know that we get any immediate, gigantic, enormous improvement because these are already, you know, some of the best athletes in the world. But they just find that it's not as stressful to stay, to, to accumulate the calories that they need. Maybe they can train with a little less fatigue accumulation because as you said, we used to put ourselves through a lot more than, than we later discovered was necessary. And I think a lot of these guys do the same. I, I think they unnecessarily torture themselves because they all train hard. They train very, very hard. But sometimes uh, uh, you can train with a, a lot less fatigue. Those are probably the big things. And then, and then long-term health, blood testing, and making some recommendations that uh, that their so their biomarkers uh, look better now and into the future. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. 
I actually got myself tested as well for uh, sleep apnea because I was really concerned about that. And yeah. I've always had a hard time breathing just in general. Apparently, I wake up four out of the five times you need to to be qualified for sleep apnea. So <laughs> I'm almost there, but not quite yet. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great because apnea can cause elevated blood pressure, as you know, and, and it can uh, decrease recovery. Uh, so that uh, a lot of the – and, you know, you don't have to be fat to have apnea. Jordan Fagenbaum from Barbell Medicine is a great powerlifter. He's only 198 pounds, and he's got a six-pack. He wears a CPAP because he has a thick neck from all those years of squatting. It's just crowding of the mm. airway. So don't assume that just because you're not 250 – uh, that a CPAP might not be able to benefit you. If you snore and wake up tired, there's a chance you have some degree of apnea. Uh, you can fetter that out a little better by using what's called a stop bang questionnaire. You can just Google that on, on social or on the internet there, stop bang questionnaire. And then furthermore, of course, you could go in and get a sleep study done and to see if you know exactly what uh, degree of apnea you have and whether or not an intervention is, is uh, recommended. But a CPAP is the best and I got to be honest with you, almost only, I've used a CPAP since 1993 and I've tried every other therapy. I've tried those stupid dental things that, that mess up your bite. And I've, I've tried I, the, the, I had a, the mouthpiece. Yeah, those don't work. And I had a doctor laser <laughs> off. At one time I had a doctor suggest that my uvula was blocking my airway and he lasered off my uvula of all things. <laughs> And I'm, I'm just, I mean, the stupid shit that I did, and I was 300 pounds. So it's not like I can't take personal responsibility for the fact that I had apnea, but I was searching for cures that didn't exist is the problem. But this is, a, this is why I say so often, even at my, at my old age, everything I've been through, if I knew then what I know now, I can help people, I can help steer them away from a lot of stupid mistakes that I've made throughout my career. Uh, a CPAP is the solution. It is 99% effective. It is life-changing, and I don't say that about a lot of things. Uh, within just a day or two, uh, you will see an enormous difference. Uh, presuming you have apnea, I'm not saying it's something that people who don't have apnea should use. It's not going to improve your breathing beyond normal breathing. But that is definitely an effective intervention and probably necessary intervention for apnea should you not be willing to lose enough weight uh, in which to remedy the problem. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I'm right there on the like I'm right there on the fence. So yeah. I really wanted to try a CPAP, but at least but that doctor won't, you know, um, what is it prescribe me one since I don't quite qualify. Yeah, but. you know, I see this a lot. You can get a CPAP on on Craigslist. I have, and if uh, somebody wants to DM me, I've got a a guy out of LA that uh, rebuilds, refurbishes, rebuilds them, and will will ship them to people without a prescription. So uh, it's important enough to me. You know, when I talk to a client, I'm like, look, you need a CPAP. And then I don't have, I'm not able to help them obtain one. Uh, it, it's it's like wasted information as far as I'm concerned. So I've, I've worked pretty hard over the years to make sure that those who need them get them. If they can't get them through a doctor or can't afford them, that I find an alternative that's affordable. Uh, they are available on Craigslist. The new BiPAPs auto, almost all of them now are, are auto they interpret your breathing and give and adjust the air based on your needs. So it's not as though you even need to specifically have, have them programmed for you. I'm talking mm. a little, a little bit fast and loose here. I know that, that medical doctors would cringe to hear this, but uh, in fact, I've had multiple sleep studies done over the years. And the last one that I had, uh, they used an auto pap at night and the next morning, the doctor looked at the auto pap at what uh, level of air it was giving me. And that's where she recommended it be set. So uh, even the even the doctors are utilizing the information from these auto paps to 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 set the ranges for, and it is a range. Uh, it used to be you'd set a specific number. Now there's a range, and the auto paps can move within that range based on how your breathing changes throughout the night. So they're much much easier to use. Okay, cool. Is there any uh, drawback you would say for an APAP versus a CPAP? Let me be more clear. I said it's an auto pap. An auto pap is a CPAP. A CPAP is kind of an old term. It's a continuous positive airway pressure or whatever. They don't really use those anymore. That's like driving down the freeway with no windshield. It's just air in your face all night long. That's what the one I used back in the 90s, and they were miserable to deal with. Now, all of them are BiPAPs. When you exhale, it stops forcing air into you, and, and it interprets your breathing. And so when you inhale, it gives you the air you need. When you exhale, it stops forcing air. They're a lot more comfortable to use now. 
And then the BiPAPs are mostly auto set, meaning you provide them a range and they will give you, uh, based on whether or not you're, if you're, if your airway is closing and they feel the resistance, they'll push more air in. So there's a range at which this, the, the BiPAP, the auto set BiPAP, there's a range at which it works within to give you the air that you need. And it, it tests, it's constantly testing that at night. And if you have an episode where you're holding your breath, it'll push more air in uh, to remedy that episode. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Jackson asks, what is a healthy blood pressure for someone on 200 milligrams of TRT? Well, I think irrespective of whether you're on TRT, the blood pressure is the same. Uh, the recommendations. Now, internationally, it's 140 over 80, I believe, or 140 over 90. I think that's that's where it's at internationally. Now, in the U.S., more recently, we've recommended, I think originally it was 130 over 80, and now it's 120 over 80. Uh, there's some speculation that uh, that's so that we can prescribe more blood pressure medication, but we do see in the literature that there's, I hate when I say this because it's, it's hard, you have to explain it. There's a linear decline in events as you lower blood pressure from 140 systolic down to 120. But it's not as though it's a line like this. It, it, it's, it's somewhat asymptotic, meaning that there's, there's relatively little risk at 140. There's even a smaller risk at 120. Uh, but uh, that's why I say that internationally in Europe, it's 140. In uh, systolic in the U.S., it's 120, and again, there's some suspicion that that was just so pharmaceutical companies could prescribe more blood pressure medication because the vast majority of the population doesn't get to 120. And the reason I mention that is because I don't think it's necessary to 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 fear monger to scare people into doing things that that uh, that aren't going to benefit them to any measurable degree. But I still think you should strive to get down into the 120s. I have a high blood pressure quick fix kit in the vertical diet ebook where I go over all the things that help with that. Sleep apnea is a huge one. Uh, you can lower your blood pressure by 20 points, remedying a severe case of sleep apnea by using a CPAP. That's a monster. Weight loss, for every two pounds you lose, you get a one point of systolic pressure drop. Those two are, are probably the number one and two. Third on that list uh, would be exercise, regular exercise. That would be your 10 minute walk. Uh, especially because we see that with blood sugar elevation comes insulin elevation and hyperinsulinemia increases blood pressure. So if you can keep insulin down, you can keep blood pressure. You, you can reduce systolic blood pressure. Next on the list is uh, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Getting 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day helps uh, with uh, uh, decreasing blood pressure, mostly because it balances water. Sometimes you see women, particularly around pregnancy, they get swollen ankles. That can be remedied with uh, an improvement in potassium intake. It helps balance the water, the sodium potassium pump. 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. I like to get that from yogurt. At least 400 milligrams of magnesium a day. We usually supplement that. It's hard to get from food. Those three go a long way to help control blood pressure. Sodium reduction for those people who have who are salt-sensitive hypertensives, uh, and that is about 20 to 30 percent of the population uh, uh, can respond poorly to increased sodium. There's also about five to 15 percent of the population that's reverse salt sensitive. If they get their sodium too low, they see an increase in blood pressure. Uh, and so uh, it, you got to kind of fetter that out. But those are the big rocks. And then if you need some medication, at least initially, the one that is the most beneficial with the least side effects is Tadalafil. It's Cialis, low dose Cialis, mm. five milligrams a day. Very effective. Just five milligrams a day, it, it vasodilates. It's kind of like beet juice. You know, they talk about beets, nitric oxide, dilating the blood vessels, opening them up. Tadalafil does it much better with a longer half-life. Uh, it's just easier to control at five milligrams a day. The neat thing about Tadalafil is it also improves endothelial function, which is your, the lining of your blood vessels. Oh, it, it does. Reduces, I didn't know that. Does. Yep. It wow. reduces uh, BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. That's... Uh, uh, kind of a swollen prostate that may result in uh, increased sense of urgency, incomplete evacuation, uh, waking up, you know, uh, frequently throughout the night. All those things can happen from the prostate getting larger, which uh, is a side effect of high DHTs can happen from certain steroid use. So Tadalafil helps with all of those things. And that's why I kind of, I come right out of the gate with that one. And it's affordable, uh, very affordable. 
I get mine through Merrick Health. Uh, so there's a whole host of benefits before you end up maybe needing uh, medication. But I cover all of that in the high blood pressure quick fix kit uh, in the Vertical Diet uh, 3.0 ebook at stanefforting.com. Nice. Oh, yeah. Thanks for uh, uh, that's actually really nice for me to hear because I, I didn't really know if, I didn't know of any uh, I guess procedures I could update to like improve my endothelial cells. I didn't know if there was like some kind of thing that would help recovery there. I just know of all the science that says how you can damage it. So it's nice to hear about that. Yeah, and I got to tell you, estrogen is pretty important for your endothelial lining too, and that's why when right. people start, yep. taking, start crushing anti-estrogens, uh-huh. thinking it's going to help you get leaner for bodybuilding show, there's a whole host of side effects, including. Uh, joint pain, libido, drop of libido, uh, mm. all that stuff. So I, I stay away from anti-estrogens. I'd rather use less testosterone and microdose it and uh, maybe use an ancillary that doesn't cause an increase in estrogen, like a primobolin or something. Uh, those would be my strategies as opposed to taking anti-estrogens. 100% my strategy as well. Um, yeah. I also add, um, I personally like to inject every day too. Just something yeah, like that. Yeah, microdose. Really Absolutely. Yep. The micro. Okay, gotcha. Yep. yep. Great plan. Uh, David asks, uh, what's the worst thing about the current state of bodybuilding? If you have an opinion on that. Well, I don't know. There's just so much to pick to choose from. It's hard to know what the worst is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's always been pretty obsessive. It, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting sport. I've been involved in it, like I said, since 1988, since I first started competing. And it's just gotten bigger and, and bigger. Uh, I think most importantly is, is the health aspect is that uh, we have seen a significant number of, of very popular bodybuilders who probably for too long uh, were not properly monitoring their health, maybe getting too heavy, suffering from apnea, having high blood pressure, who have passed away from those things. Uh, bodybuilding is supposed to be, uh, it, it, it is intended to be somewhat healthy. Uh, I, I've always kind of looked at it that way, <laughs> although I understand that when competing, you know, I've said before that if you want to be healthy, don't compete. That fitness is the ability to perform a particular duty or task, and, and uh, uh, the fitness level required to be a pro bodybuilder, or a pro strongman, or a UFC fighter is not healthy. And so, a lot of what we talk about is just how to mitigate damage while still trying to achieve our goals, so that uh, we don't have long term problems as a result of these uh, our efforts here in our younger age. I think Joe Rogan said it was like um, building a sandcastle. Eventually, it's all going to go away. <laughs> yeah. That's true. We all just like to see some sort of excellence, but this excellence is definitely becoming superhuman. Yeah. Canel asks, what was your biggest struggle when starting your lifting career? Uh, when starting out as a little skinny guy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was the, it- I, I, the biggest mistake I made is that I, I thought you grew in the gym. We talked a little earlier about, you know, we thought with the heavier weight we lifted, the bigger we get. And so I spent a lot of hours in the gym when I was starting out as a little tiny guy. And uh, I mean, like two hours a day, six days a week, I was in there just crushing weights, doing tons and tons and tons of sets and reps and junk volume and just crushing myself. And uh, to add insult to injury, I started eating the diet that was recommended by the bodybuilder guy that was working behind the desk at Gold's Gym, which was primarily tuna fish and rice cakes. So obviously, <laughs> I love those guys. Fun I was overtraining and I was under eating. And, and it took me two years until I ran into a, a smarter individual, a gym owner, promoter, competitor who had been many years in the business. He said, look, you, you need to flip the script. You're doing this all wrong. He said, you need to train less and eat more. So I went to training one hour, four days a week and crushing calories. And that's when I started really gaining some more size. And then I got diagnosed when I was 20 with uh, low T, as I mentioned, from uh, varicocele. And that's when I discovered that that was a huge component. And I think that's why everybody should get a blood test. Uh, Especially, I see high school kids and their dads are concerned about uh, their kid being underweight. You're going to need to get a blood test because in the absence of testosterone, I don't care how hard you work and how much you eat, it's going to be very hard for you to gain muscle. Uh, So that was a a big eye-opener for me. Nice. The Alpha Raid asked kind of an interesting question. What's the age where Natty needs a bit of help to keep gains in its course? Are you talking about what age should you consider performance enhancing drugs? Is that? It sounds like that's what he's going for. Yeah. If he wanted to, I guess, continue his progress. Yeah, I don't think there's an age. I mean, you'd have to look to, to uh, there is a limit. 
to what can be achieved and it's genetically predetermined. Some people are just, you know, hyper responders. They're, they're bigger than others. So we've all seen folks in high school that are, that are bigger than other kids. And, and that's, uh, it's a genetic predisposition. So, but the idea that, you know, beyond say, you get past say three plus years of good, four plus years of good solid hard training, the gains after that point are, are smaller and smaller. And, and, and that, you know, again, genetically predetermined. And if you're doing everything you can during those first three years to maintain a calorie surplus and to train hard and progress over time, you got to remember Jay Cutler was the same size at 18 as he was when he won the Mr. Olympia and then throughout his career. What? There's certain, <laughs> yes, there's certain people uh, who you just see at a very young age who respond very, very well to lifting weights. They, they just, their muscles seem to, to respond well. And that's not to say Jay was natural at 18. I'm not, I'm not claiming that. I'm just saying that, that uh, if your predisposition isn't to pack on lots of muscle and you're struggling for many years, it, it may not be in the cards for you. Even with performance enhancing drugs, uh, you might not, be able to achieve the level as a, a hyper responder who's more genetically predispositioned to gain muscle who's also using uh, performance enhancing drugs that's the differentiating factor amongst professional mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're hyper responders and their predisposition genetics reign supreme and so we'll always have to consider that so i don't think there's an age necessarily i, I think one thing you need to consider when you make the move from natural to performance enhancing drugs is there's a potential that that's a life sentence when you start performance enhancing drugs, there's a good chance if you're on enough of them for a, a long enough period of time in which your testosterone levels may never recover to the same levels that they are currently. And you may find that uh, you'll lose a substantial amount of that muscle when you again go natural. And that can be very challenging for some people, depending on how uh, how much their psyche is caught up on in their, in their physique. Uh, and I understand that wholeheartedly because I've been involved in that myself, uh, the bigorexia you know, uh, is, is a very real thing where it's very, very hard to lose weight and strength and size and, uh, uh identifying yourself as a, as a certain type of individual and then not being able to sustain that over time can be challenging for you psychologically. So, uh, c consider that that is, uh, uh, that's a long, uh, commitment and the side effects are always there. Hair loss, acne, you know, increased, uh, called dyslipidemia. There's, there's a potential for side effects that, uh, you may or may not uh, have anticipated or uh, appreciate when this whole focus is done. Samuel asks how to manage hemoglobin while on TRT. I, I don't think that, uh, TRT compromises HA1C. Uh, I think you manage HA1C the same way on TRT as you do off of TRT. Uh, TRT may actually help with uh, HA1C or just blood sugars in general, insulin sensitivity in general, because it improves, uh, it increases lean body mass and uh, muscle is a sink for glucose. And the more muscle that you have, and it's particularly if it's regularly exercised, uh, that improves your blood sugars, your fasted blood sugar. We talked earlier about uh, leading indicators being triglycerides and insulin, fasted insulin, uh, and the lagging indicators being your fasted glucose and your HA1C. Uh, but I think all of those numbers would improve on uh, HRT as a result of the increased lean body mass. And the best thing is uh, obviously maintaining a healthy body mass, uh, uh, body weight. Um, blood sugars tend to go up with uh, increased fatty liver and fat around the pancreas. Um, that, and then overconsumption, we call uh, just uh, uh, excess energy. Uh, it's not necessarily due to carbohydrates, it's due to the fact that calories in general have filled all of your fat stores and now you're not very efficiently able to put the glucose into storage. Uh, and if your fat cells are, are full and you can't get the glucose in there and you can't get them in the muscles, then you're going to start accumulating high blood sugars. And so uh, weight loss is generally the, the second thing on the list, uh, or actually probably the most important thing for, uh, for insulin resistance. The 10 minute walks help. Mm. Um, but weight loss is the most important thing and, and muscle mass is the second. And Michael asks lipoproteins on vertical diet. It's not really a question, but, uh, I, I understand it. Um, I've never recommended more than 30% total fat intake as a percentage of total calories. And of the fats, I want you to lose, use lean sources, uh, top sirloin steak, uh, bison, 96, four ground beef, egg, egg white blends, uh, fat free Greek yogurt. Uh, a lean source of protein usually has less than 30% saturated fat 
uh, as a percentage of total calories of the fat. So let's do the math. If 30% of your total calories are fat and 30% of those fat calories are saturated fat, that's 9%. That is below the American Heart Association's recommendation for saturated fat intake as it can adversely affect or increase LDL. What is the recommendation? Mine is to, to keep saturated fats below 10%, and that's been consistent with the diet that I've recommended for over a decade. Keep your fats below 30% and use lean sources, which means your saturated fats will be less, less than 10%. Because remember, 50% of, of even red meat is monounsaturated fat. And so you just use leaner sources like a top sirloin steak has much lower saturated fat and total fat uh, as a percentage of total calories because it's 50% protein. And so mm. as opposed to eating butter uh, or bacon uh, or ribeyes, I don't recommend butter or bacon or ribeyes in any significant quantity. I recommend lean meats and you can throw chicken and turkey in there if you'd like, egg, egg, white blends and uh, yogurt and then salmon twice a week. That'll keep your saturated fats below 10%, which will help LDLs. Also, you want to have sufficient fiber, especially soluble fiber. Fruits can help with that. A little bit of oatmeal. You can take some psyllium husk if you'd like. But the only way to really know how you personally respond is to get a blood test and look at your LDL because some people are hyperabsorbers. They can't even eat eggs. 20% of the population will have an increase in their cholesterol from dietary cholesterol. The vast majority of people will not. 80% of the population can eat eggs and it will not increase their LDL. Uh, but you have to find out if you're one of those people that's a hyperabsorber of cholesterol. And then that then you can start to make those decisions. Should I or should I not eat eggs? Should I or and ultimately to the point of which, you know, do you need medication? Some people have familial hypercholesterolemia. Lane Norton, natural athlete, uh, eats 60 grams of fiber a day. He couldn't get his LDL below 130. So he started taking, uh, I believe, a statin, possibly a Zetamide, which is not a statin, or dual therapy mm -hmm. uh, to bring his LDL down because it is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Now, it's multifactorial. I'm not saying that having a slightly elevated LDL puts you at the same risk as somebody who also has uh, diabetes, smokes, drinks, and anything else that compromises the endothelial layer. Uh, I'm saying it's multifactorial and there's a overall risk assessment that you do based on your general health using many of these factors. But LDL is an independent risk factor. And in so much as you can get that down below 100 and ideally 80, there doesn't, it seems as though you have much less likelihood of accumulating atherosclerotic plaque over time. And understand that this is a, uh, this is a lifespan intervention, that uh, the, first, the average first heart attack is age 65. So when a 30-year-old person tells me they're not concerned about saturated fat, I have to caution them that this is something that accumulates over many decades. And that's probably the better time to be concerned about is when you're 30, because then you don't have to worry about it when you're 65. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Well, Stan, normally I like to keep these podcasts to about an hour and 15, but <laughs> you are a wealth of information, so we definitely went double that time. So just want to thank say you, thank you so much for coming on this podcast, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, um, where can everyone find you? Uh, everything like Stan Efforting. StanEfforting.com is my website. And on there, there's a link to my meal prep company. Uh, I serve meals nationwide, prep them and ship them. And uh, my ebooks are on there. Uh, Instagram is at Stan Efforting and YouTube is Stan Efforting. Lots of free content on there. My Rhinos Rants. Uh, fun to watch. Awesome. Yeah, I love those. <laughs> Thanks again. Um, and thank you guys for uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you would like to so support the podcast, uh, the best non-cost way is to rate us a five stars on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And then finally, uh, if you guys do have symptoms of low T or want to um, explore any of the things that we were talking about in this podcast, uh, you can go to um, uh, Stan is with Merrick Health and then I am with Transcend HRT. And those are both very, um, I'd say very valuable sources you guys can go to for some professional medical advice. So thanks again, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother.